You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the ninth part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. If you're not careful, I'll catch up. Cannonbolt curled up and rolled off. Not a chance. It was well into the evening when Class 1 staggered into a clearing, where the camp was waiting. Each student was absolutely exhausted and suffering the backlash of overusing their quirks. Some examples included Siro, who was dehydrated, Yuraraka, who was clutching her stomach, and Yeyorazu, who had used so many lipids that she had to be carried by Ida. Kaminari was still a little out of it after using too much electricity, frying his brain. Sato looked like he was about to pass out after using all of his sugar supply, and mind his hair was more red than purple after all the blood he'd shed. Even Midoriya was exhausted, he'd transformed so often that the Ultimatrix had timed out several times. At one point, he'd tried to clear away whole mobs of constructs as way big. But a tidal wave of Earth had nearly buried him alive. Apparently, Pixie Bob thought that was cheating. Speaking of Pixie Bob, she was nearly in hysterics when she saw the students limp over. Mandalay looked a little more apologetic, but not enough that anyone would think she was sincere. Aizawa was leaning against one of the buildings dotting the campsite, tucked inside his sleeping bag with one eye open. The students didn't need to know him to know they'd get no sympathy. Hey, look at that, Mandalay said. You made it here before the sun completely set. Nice job. You said it would take us three hours to get here. Ashido moaned. Vandalay shrugged. Sorry, that's how long it would take one of us to make it through that course. Thanks for rubbing it in, Siro rasped. Beside him, Asui riveted weakly. Hey, you all did great, Pixie Bob said. Her eyes then became calculating. Especially you. Midoriya became understandably flustered as Pixie Bob was suddenly well inside his personal space, admiring him in ways that really didn't make him comfortable. You've definitely got some growing to do, but after you graduate, I'll have to be quick to snap you up. Pixie Bob's paw reached out for his face, only to miss when Yuraraka tugged him out of the way. Please don't manhandle my boyfriend, Yuraraka said tiredly. Midoriya made a noise of agreement as he hid behind her. Pixie Bob drooped. Dang it she looked at several of the other boys in the class who had done well in the forest. But Todoroki was suddenly pulled away by Ashido, and Ida was protected by a stern glare that Yeyorazu directed at the hero. That left only Bekugo as Pixie Bob's target, but he just scowled. Try it, and I'll turn you into a smear on the floor. Now I really am out of luck, Pixie Bob groaned. Aizawa glanced at Mandalay. How long has she been like this? It's recent, Mandalay admitted. She's getting really sensitive about her age. She thinks she needs to find a man as soon as possible, or it'll be too late. Tell her not to flirt with my students, Aizawa warned. That's a media frenzy waiting to happen. Mandalay nodded tiredly, as if she was used to this, then narrowed her eyes at Pixie Bob. The other woman suddenly flinched, and Midoriya figured that Mandalay had sent her a scathing lecture via her quirk, telepathy. After that, she turned to the students, who had already figured out that Mandalay was the saner of the pussycats they'd met so far. Anyway, considering you had no idea we'd be doing this, how about we make it up to you with a nice dinner? Mandalay smiled. We won't do this again, though, you'll have to make your own meals after tonight. The class perked up at that, but Midoriya still had a lingering question. Excuse me, but whose kid is that? Mandalay glanced at the young boy who seemed to be trying to glower at each individual, yet no one in particular. That's Koda, he's my nephew. Midoriya knelt in front of Koda so that he could look him in the eye. Hi, Koda, I'm. The noise that escaped Midoriya's mouth wasn't one normally made by humans. Then again, most humans weren't punched in the groin by children. Koda sneered as Midoriya fell over with a wheeze. The other rising stars rushed over to him, even Ben materialized, though only Midoriya could see him, and winced. You little heathen. Ida chopped at the air and glared at Koda. That was uncalled for. Like I care. Koda tried to glare while keeping his hat pulled low. It didn't work, and only Midoriya could see the anger and hurt in his eyes, since he was on the ground. Koda, Mandalay reached out for her nephew, but the boy had already stormed off. She turned and shrugged apologetically. I'm sorry, he's going through a lot right now. 
it's okay. Midoriya managed through clenched teeth as he gratefully accepted a chunk of ice from Todoroki. Back with the rest of the class, Bekugo smirked. I like that kid. Hiroshima rolled his eyes. Of course you do. Enough, Aizawa said, getting the students' attention. Get your things off the bus, then come eat. After that, you can bathe and get some sleep. Enjoy it while you can, because tomorrow, training really starts. To no one's surprise, though to mind his disappointment, the class's sleeping arrangements were divided by gender. The boys' bunkroom was much larger than the girls, but everyone still had enough room for themselves. The students quickly unpacked, then went to eat. Dinner was loud, chaotic, and almost enough to make Midoriya forget about the hellish fighting just a few hours earlier. The food was amazing, made even better after working so hard to get to it. It was also almost enough for him to forget the pain between his legs, though that had finally faded. Rather than simple showers that other campsites might have, the Pussycat's property had actual hot springs. Clad in a towel, Midoriya sank into the steaming water, his exhausted muscles and still sore groin immediately relaxed. He took a deep breath and let all of his anxieties melt away. He would worry about training later, but for now, he was content. I can't believe we fell for Aizawa Sensei's crap again, Kaminari muttered nearby, even as he also sighed in relief. When are we going to learn? When we stop comparing UA to normal schools, Siro replied. We should have known we'd hit the ground running. Hiroshima snorted, but since he'd sunk up to his nose in the water, he created a surge of bubbles before he sat up. Well, since we were fighting actual dirt monsters, I don't think that's a metaphor anymore. I still don't know what I'm going to do here, Shinso said. All I did earlier was run around and try not to get squished. Well, you're behind on the physical part of hero training, Midoriya pointed out. Think of this as catching up. Do you always fight monsters? Midoriya opened his eyes and shrugged. Usually, it's robots or sparring with each other. Ugh, robots. Shinso ran a hand through his messy hair. I hate robots. That reminds me, Midoriya said. Is there anyone your quirk doesn't work on? Besides Wildmutt, Siro added. Shinso thought about it for a moment. Well, the person has to hear my question and reply. So deaf people are immune, and they have to be able to speak. I'm not sure if there are other limits, though. Maybe you'll find out in training, Kirishima suggested. I'll let you use your quirk on me, if you want. Excuse me, Takoyami cut in. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Maita is being Maita. All eyes turned to the student in question. He was standing in front of the wall separating the baths, hands on his hips and looking determined. This is it, he said, almost to himself. Beyond this wall is the greatest sight my eyes will ever see. Hey, of oh, Maita. Kirishima waited until Maita looked at him. I'm pretty sure I know what you're about to do, and I really don't think you should do it. Why not? Maita demanded. I might never get another chance at this. There why? Hiroshima jerked his thumb back, and Maita's blood ran cold. They hadn't moved from their seats, but four students in particular were suddenly a lot less relaxed. Siro had angled one elbow in Maita's direction. It looked like he was leaning, but he was readying his tape for a clean shot. Ida leaned forward, ready to burst out of the water, even without his quirk. He could easily sprint to mind his location. Tiny wisps of cold drifted off Todoroki's shoulder, and his right hand rested on the lip of the hot spring. He could freeze Minda solid in an instant. Midoriya looked almost bored, save for his intense stare, and his hand hovering over the ultimatrix. Minda had no idea what he would turn into, but he really didn't want to find out. Yeah, think about it, Kirishima went on. Midoriya is dating Uraraka, pretty sure Todoroki and Ashido are a thing. He waited for Todoroki to nod before continuing. And I don't know about Siro and Asui or Ida and Yamomo, but I think they'd still kill you on principle. He shrugged. I mean, we all would, but they get first dibs. For a brief moment, Minda actually considered going for it, regardless of the risk, but self-preservation won out, and he sat back in the water with a sulk. Smartest thing he's done today, Siro muttered. As everyone settled back down, only Midoriya noticed that the Ultimatrix had made that crackling sound again. It reminded him that he had to ask Ben about that, and he wouldn't let the hologram deflect his questions again. This time, he would get some answers. On the other side of the hot spring, the girls of Class 1 are relaxed. Gyro had heard Minta's heavy breathing minutes ago, and they had all been prepared to dive under the steaming water to prevent Minta from looking at them if he actually tried something. Thankfully, that hadn't been necessary. I love those boys, Ashido sighed. They're the best shield against perverts a girl could ask for. I kinda wanted to know what Midoriya would turn into to kill Minta, Gyro admitted. We should blame the pussycats, Yeyorazu said. They should have staggered the time so that the little troll wouldn't have had an opportunity. He's been getting closer and closer to crossing the line. 
and when he does, we can watch him get expelled, Ribbit. Asui sank deeper into the water and closed her eyes. Enough about him, let's just enjoy this. It was still pretty cute that your boyfriends were ready to leap to your defense, Hagakir pointed out. Only Yuraraka looked pleased, the other three girls just looked embarrassed. Shoto and I just started dating. Ashido protested. We're not official or anything. Tenya and I are friends, Yeyurazu insisted, though it was ruined by a red face that had nothing to do with the water. Asui didn't say anything. Instead, she riveted and completely submerged herself. Hagakur and Gyro shared a glance, at least, it seemed that the former did, and burst out laughing. After bathing, the students had an hour to themselves before going to bed. Midoriya took the opportunity to address something that had been bothering him for a while. He made sure he wasn't followed as he hid behind some trees just outside the camp. Ben, we need to talk. Yeah, buddy. Ben materialized, head tilted. What, 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 what's up? That? Midoriya pointed at him. We need to talk about that. You've been glitching out since I island. No, since before that, with the flickering. I know you're not telling me everything, but now the Ultimatrix is acting weird. I need to know. Ben closed his eyes and turned away for a moment. I should have said something when the Ultimatrix first malfunctioned. It's it's my fault. I shouldn't have tried to find a way to subvert my programming. Midoriya blinked. You did what? Ben smiled bitterly. Blame the real Ben. If I hadn't become self-aware, I wouldn't have even tried this. I rationalized delaying my own final dispensation, you could say. You're still not telling me what you did or what this is all about. Right? Sorry. Ben made a show of taking a deep breath, then flickered wildly. Dang it. Anyway, you remember how I've always said that I'm a tutorial program. Well, if you've played a video game, you know that tutorials stop after a while while while. He flickered again. I was supposed to remain online until you were completely ready to set out on your own by Ben's standards, on your own meant getting the ultimates. Even then, every step you took was another subroutine that I no longer kept active. It took Midoriya a moment to realize what Ben was saying. Wait, me becoming a better hero was killing you. I was never really alive, so 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 I don't know if that statement applies, but that's philosophy for another day. Ben smiled at his own joke, but it faded when he saw how horrified Midoriya looked. Anyway, I knew how badly you'd take it if I just went poof, but I couldn't figure out how to tell you, so I didn't. Why didn't you tell the other Ben, or Asmuth? Midoriya asked. They could have fixed you. Probably not, Ben said. If anything, I'm 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 fulfilling my programming. Programming they gave me. You don't need me anymore, so. That's not true. Tears welled up in Midoriya's eyes, and Ben flinched. You're the first real friend I've ever had, my best friend. Why you're practically my brother. Ben suddenly found the ground very interesting. You shouldn't say that. I'm a computer program, and I was never meant to be your friend. Then why did you try to stay longer than your programming said you should? Midoriya demanded. Ben smiled sadly. The downside of becoming self-aware. I wanted something for myself, to the detriment of someone else. My software is degrading more and more, and it's starting to affect the Ultimatrix's systems the glitches. You turning into the wrong alien, that kind of thing. The watch might have been able to handle it 30 years ago, but it's old, and it was rebuilt from scraps. Honestly, it's kind of amazing that it works as well as it does. Midoriya was silent for a moment. What did you want for yourself? You and your mom kept saying I was part of your family. Ben laughed, but it was bitter and sad. I guess I didn't want to leave my family. Is, is there any way to fix this? Ben shrugged. I don't know. Maybe Asmuth could figure it out, but you'd have to contact him through the Tennysons. If I recall, 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 their last meeting didn't end well. He flickered again and looked down at his hands. And I don't think I'll last that long. Midoriya's mind raced as he tried to think of something, anything, to help his friend. Wait a second. You said that you were supposed to shut down after you unlocked the Ultimates. Yes, Ben looked at him strangely. What are you getting at? What would happen if you locked that function again? Hey, huh. Ben blinked rapidly as he processed that. That would slow down the degradation, at least a little. Maybe enough to get through the training camp so you can call the real Ben. They could call him now. Did you forget the rules 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 Aizawa talked about yesterday? Ben crossed his arms. No phone calls until we're on the way back. He threatened to expel anyone who broke that rule, and my core programming takes precedence here. I will intentionally deactivate before I let you ruin your chances of being a hero. His smile turned kind. Shutting off the ultimates will buy me time. I promise, we just have to get through this training. Midoriya didn't like it. In fact, he wanted to give the proverbial finger to the rules so that he could save Ben. But he knew that Ben could only bend his programming so far, and if he thought that Midoriya would give up his dream, he would take the decision out of his hands. In order to save him, Midoriya would have to let him suffer, and it made him sick. Do it, he finally said. 
I'd rather lose the Ultimates for a while than lose you forever. Ben nodded. A moment later, the Ultimatrix beeped and the dial briefly turned. It's done. The degradation has slowed down considerably. Thank goodness. Midoriya was still worried, but now Ben had a fighting chance. Now that the drama is out of the way, Ben said, you should get some sleep. You have a lot of work to do. Thank you for seeing me on such short notice, Tsukachi said as he sat down. I know that you're very busy. You told me that you had information regarding Eri-chan. Nezu pointed out. It would have been irresponsible and heartless to delay this meeting. More like a lack of information, Tsukachi corrected sheepishly, but then became deadly serious. It was, quite frankly, astonishing that there is no record of the girl anywhere. I even reached out on an international level to see if she was the victim of human trafficking. But there was no report of a girl matching her description going missing. He laced his fingers together in a way that Nezu's paws couldn't, something the principal was jealous of. Eventually, I went to our internal affairs department and suggested that Iri's existence might have been covered up by someone in law enforcement. That was a big risk, detective, Nezu said. Your career could be jeopardized. It paid off. Tsukachi handed over a flash drive. You'll find the details there, but the short version is that an officer who retired a few years back had ties to the Yakuza. They used those ties to force him to erase all digital and physical evidence. We wanted to bring him in for questioning, but he's dead, heart attack, the coroner says. That's suspicious, Nezu mused. But the Yakuza, they've been nearly wiped out, haven't they? We thought the same thing, but they've still got enough influence to pull off something this risky. Tsukachi sighed. I'm aware that Sir Nidai's agency is currently investigating a Yakuza group. I'll get in touch with him and see if Uri has any connection to his case. Thank you, Nezu said. Any information about Uri Chan would be appreciated. May I inform her guardians about these developments, and anything else you discover? Guardians, Midoriya Izuku and Yuraraka Achako, Nezu explained. They were the ones who rescued Uri Chan in the first place, and she's quite close to them. Tsukachi thought about it for a moment. Very well, but please keep the circle small. And I'd advise against telling the girl anything she doesn't put forward herself, I've heard she's quite fragile. Nezu's thoughts drifted to Iri. At the moment, she was being watched by Recovery Girl, and probably being spoiled rotten. The old nurse treated people better the younger they were, so Iri was like a granddaughter to her by now. Don't worry, detective, I think she'll be in good hands. What worried him was how Midoriya and Yuraraka, and, by extension, the rest of their friends, would react when they found out concrete details about Iri's past. He just hoped that their training would prepare them for any future conflict. Midoriya had wondered about what kind of training he and his class would go through. Within two hours, he regretted ever thinking about it. He wasn't alone. Even the most resolute of class wanna hated their lives at that moment. Training had begun at the crack of dawn. Aizawa had kicked down their doors and dragged them outside, in a few cases, literally, to where the pussycats were waiting. This time, it was the entire team. Mandalay and Pixie Bob were joined by Ragdoll, a woman with green hair, yellow outfit, and an orange ring painted around one eye, and Tiger, a tall, muscular man with short brown hair and a triangular beard. He wore a brown version of his female teammates' costumes, despite how silly he looked. He had quickly become the most terrifying of the four. The goal of the training was simple, quirks, like muscles, got stronger as they recovered from heavy use. With that in mind, each student would push his or her quirk past its limit. If such a thing just wasn't possible, then how they used their quirk would be the focus. Each student had a specific training regimen, tailored in such a way that they would get the most out of their efforts. Unlike training at UA, Midoriya and his friends had no time to support each other, they were too busy trying not to die. Siro spent hours shooting tape into the distance, with only short water breaks to make sure he didn't die from dehydration. The goal was to improve the strength of his tape, and the speed with which it was created. After the first hour, Siro didn't even care. He just focused on shooting his tape and not falling over. Sui focused on improving her muscles by climbing up a sheer cliff, not just with her arms and legs, but also her tongue. Before the day was over, even her tongue was blistered and worn out. Hida ran the entire perimeter of the camp all day. When he wasn't pushing his engines to the point of stalling out, he was running normally to increase the strength of his legs. His only breaks involved exercises for his core and arms to keep his entire body in shape. Ashido continually used her acid against pillars created by Pixie Bob. 
she increased the potency in increments, building up her resistance so that she could use stronger acid later. She had also been provided with an acid-proof gym uniform, so that she could use her acid over her entire body without worrying about melting her clothes. Todoroki created rapid fire waves of fire and ice. The point was to build up his resistance to temperature, so that he could use even colder ice and hotter fire. He was also trying to speed up how quickly he could create both, with the goal of using them at the same time. Geyarazu sat at a table next to Sato, she created a variety of objects, while both of them ate as much food as possible. One of her weaknesses was that it could take some time to make something, so she was using her quirk as much as possible to speed up the process. It was also hoped that her quirk would adapt to let her create objects with fewer lipids spent. When Yuraraka wasn't lifting boulders with her quirk, she was making herself float. She was trying to reduce her nausea, while also improving how much weight she could lift at any one time. At the moment, her limit was just over 2 tons. Aizawa told her in no uncertain terms that he expected her to add another 400 pounds to that limit by the time they returned to UA. Midoriya had proved to have the most difficulty. The sheer variety of his aliens meant that he couldn't focus on just one to practice with. The Pussycats had files on all his available forms, so they decided on 5 for every single day training one at a time until the Ultimatrix ran out of power. When that happened, he would spend another hour training as a human, running, push-ups, or anything else Tiger could come up with. At the moment, he was sparring against Tiger as four arms, or, rather, he was trying to spar. Tiger's quirk, Playa Body, allowed him to twist and contort as if he didn't have any bones at all. Even with four fists striking from different angles, four arms had yet to land a single hit. It was almost as frustrating as sparring against Tagata. Wait a minute. Four arms narrowed his eyes and then drew back his arms. He clapped his hands together, creating a booming shockwave that bowled Tiger over. The big man rolled to his feet and shook his head to clear the ringing in his ears. Not bad, Tiger admitted. You should have followed up, though. This might be a spar, but you shouldn't let your opponent recover. Okay, four arms said tiredly, just as the Ultimatrix dial flashed red. A moment later, he turned back to normal. Well, looks like your break is starting. Tiger chuckled. Get some water, and then I want to see you running laps. Yes, sir. Midoriya shuffled over to a small stand that had been set up for the students, with cups and chilled water on a table. I think that's the first time I've seen Tiger get hit in a while, Mandalay. Who was in charge of the stand, said cheerfully. Of course, now he's going to work you twice as hard. Midoriya groaned. He wished he could turn into swamp fire to get rid of his aches and pains, but Aizawa had expressly forbidden using him. He claimed it went against the point of the training, but Midoriya thought he was just being cruel. Oh, I wanted to apologize for yesterday, Mandalay said. About Koda, I mean. Midoriya caught a tiny bit of movement in the corner of his eye. There was a puff of dust as someone much smaller than anyone except Minter ran around the corner of the cabin. It's fine, he said. But why does he hate me so much? It's not you, it's heroes in general. Mandalay sighed and handed him some water. He's been like that since his parents died. Did you hear about the Water Hose Heroes? Midoriya thought about it, then winced. Water Hose was the shared name of a two-person hero team, specializing in rescue work, usually those that required water-based quirks. They had been killed in the line of duty two years earlier by a villain known as Muscular. While Water Hose hadn't been too high on the charts, their deaths had been an unexpected tragedy in the hero community. I know what happened, he said. What does that have to do with Koda? They were his parents. Those four words made Midoriya drop his water in shock. Since then, anything having to do with quirks or heroes sets him off. Even I can't get him to talk sometimes. Mandalay sighed again. Anyway, I just wanted you to know where he's coming from. I, I understand. Midoriya turned away, but then paused. Um, and sorry for your loss. Mandalay's smile was pained, but sincere. Thank you. Now, you'd better get going, or Tiger is gonna give you even more to do. Midoriya winced, and then took off jogging. He tried to stay focused on his training, but his thoughts kept drifting back to Koda. He wanted to help the boy, but he had no idea how to even talk to him, let alone save him from the pain he was clearly in. Well, I've got some time to think while I run. Maybe I'll come up with something. I was wondering if you'd gotten lost, or chickened out, Dabai taunted as members of the Vanguard squad assembled at the forest's edge. Hey, you should know better than to rush a lady, Toga snapped as she adjusted her new equipment, a mask over her mouth, a scarf decorated with fangs, and set of tanks on her back that connected to large syringes. Ugh, I hate this. Couldn't they have gotten me something cute? A young boy in a middle schooler's uniform and an armored gas mask shrugged. It's from the black market, be lucky if it even works. No, she has a point, mustard, a beautiful woman with long, red hair said. 
She wore a black double diamond mask and wore an outfit of blacks and purples. A lady should always look her best. I totally agree, twice said, leaning towards the older woman with obvious affection. You know the old saying, if you look good, you feel good. Which is total bullshit. See, slice and twice get it. Toga had pulled off her mask, revealing her puffed out cheeks. It would have been cute. But the other villains had quickly come to recognize the sadistic glint in her eyes. Slice fondly patted the girl on the head. Now, now, I know that look. Save it for the heroes, okay. She glanced at Dabai. Where are the others? Already at their positions. Dabai sat down on a rock and rested his head in one hand. I hate to admit it, but Shigaraki made the right call when he paired Muscular and Chimera. That dog guy is probably the only one who can keep that psycho in line. Slice raised a perfectly manicured eyebrow. What about Moonfish? Toga made a face, twice hugged himself dramatically, and even the stoic mustard shuddered. Dabai shrugged. Hey, he's held down by Spinner and Magni. They'll let him out tomorrow night, since we have time. Do you want to call any of the heroes for yourself? Slice sat down across from him. I know Magni wants to kill at least one of those pussycats, don't ask me why. She doesn't like girls she thinks are prettier than her, twice piped up. She told me that in confidence, please don't say anything. If I see one, I'll kill them, but the one I want to kill isn't here. Dabai smiled, stretching the staples holding his skin together. Believe me, if he was here, I'd have burned down this whole forest by now. Just leave any cute wannabes to me, Toga demanded. I know we're not supposed to kill them, but I just want to find a few that I like and make them so much prettier. Mustard slowly put Slice between him and Toga. Dabai chuckled. Hey, as long as you don't kill them, go nuts. Oh, thanks, Dabai. You're the best, you know, when you're not all broody. Tomorrow night can't come soon enough, Mustard whispered. The students were allowed two hours for dinner, which was code for 20 minutes of eating, and using the rest of the time to rest, in case of a last-minute burst of training. The rising stars were so tired that they couldn't even scrounge up the energy to stick together. Instead, they sat wherever they could, ate, and in Asui and Siro's case, fell asleep. Asui, like all the other students who had failed the exam, had been given even more grueling exercises and shorter breaks than anyone else and were so tired that they could barely get their food. Thankfully, their classmates had taken pity on them and helped prepare their meals. Midoriya found himself eating dinner next to Shizaki and Kendo. Both girls were as exhausted as he was, Kendo's hands were swollen and red, and she could barely hold her chopsticks, while even Shizaki's vines looked tired. We have two more weeks of this, Kendo groaned. I think I'm gonna die. Look on the bright side, Midoriya said, if we don't die, think of how much stronger we'll be. Shizaki made a noise that might have been agreement, or it could have been air escaping her lungs as she flopped over, fast asleep. At least she can recover faster in sunlight, Kendo muttered petulantly. Watch, she'll be back to her old self as soon as the sun comes out. Midoriya wished he had the energy to write that down in a notebook, because that was really interesting. He was reminded of how many attributes hawks shared with birds, and wondered if Shizaki had a similar relationship with plants. His thoughts derailed when he spotted Koda in the distance. He was walking up a path near the base of the mountain, hands shoved in his pockets and posture hunched. Midoriya was reminded of his own childhood, and how his quirkless status had driven him to despair. Koda's situation wasn't like his, but Midoriya had learned the value of just having someone around. Maybe the boy needed a stranger to vent to. I think I'm gonna go for a walk, Midoriya said and got up quietly, so as not to wake Shizaki. See you later, Kendo-san. Kendo waved him off, and then took a cue from her classmate and fell asleep. Midoriya grabbed another helping of food and took it with him up the path. It took a while, but he found Koda, sitting on a rock and staring at nothing in particular. Midoriya coughed to get his attention, and when the boy whirled around, he held up the tray of food. I didn't see you eating, Midoriya said. I thought you might be hungry. Koda scowled. Go away. This is my secret base. Midoriya didn't leave, but he kept his distance. He didn't want to get punched again. This is a cool spot for a secret base. I wish I'd had something like this. Why would you want a place to be alone? Koda sneered. I thought heroes loved attention. Actually, I get nervous talking to strangers. Midoriya shrugged. Sometimes I get nervous talking to friends, too. He pointed to another rock. Can I sit down? Whatever. Taking that as a yes, Midoriya sat down. Why do y'all want to be alone? Because I hate heroes, Koda growled. My aunt is always talking about work, and she drags me around to be with people I hate. Then he paused and glanced back at Midoriya. Why did you want to be alone? Midoriya smiled bitterly. When I was a kid, I thought I was quirkless. Everyone treated me like a freak, and no one wanted me around. There were times I wanted to just hide from everything. 
I wish I was quirkless. Kota looked down at his hands. If quirks weren't around, then heroes wouldn't be around, and then my parents. Heroes were around before quirks, Midoriya said before he could stop himself, after everything he'd gone through. Hearing someone say they wished they were quirkless set him off. Firefighters, doctors, anyone who stepped in to help for no reason, they were all called heroes before it became a job. That's dumb, Kota said. Why should anyone risk their lives to save someone else? They'll just get killed. So that's what it is, Midoriya thought. Because of what happened to his parents, he thinks anyone who acts like a hero will die. What about the people they're trying to save? He asked. If they don't step in, and someone dies, then someone else's family has to mourn. Because of heroes, there's a chance that nobody dies. Kota whirled around. Well, that didn't work for my parents. You don't get it, do you? Just leave me alone. Common sense doesn't really work on kids, Ben commented. Especially if they're still grieving. You should probably give him some space. Okay, Kota. Midori arose and tried to ignore his protesting muscles. But you should still eat. Kota turned around and pulled his hat lower, not saying a word. Midoriya left, uncertain whether he'd made things better or worse. You can't save everyone, Ben said sadly, especially if they don't want to be saved. Midoriya nodded tiredly. He was so wrapped up in his thoughts that he jumped when Yuraraka put a hand on his arm. Sorry, Deku-kun, she said, as Midoriya worked to get his pulse back down to healthy levels. What's wrong? You look so sad. I'm okay, it's just... Midoriya sighed and hugged her, nestling his head on her shoulder. Can I just stay here for a minute? Yuraraka could tell that he was upset, but he didn't know quite what to say. Without knowing what was on his mind, all Yuraraka could do was hold him. Sure thing, Deku-kun. She reached up and stroked his hair. Sure thing. The second official day of training was much like the first. Pushing the students past their limits in a way that was just barely considered ethical, if you were to look at it the right way, and squint. Midoriya was already tired when he started, and when the sun actually rose, he felt like he was ready for bed. Come on, Midoriya. Pixie Bob laughed. You can do better than that. Edel would have scowled, but his insectoid features were incapable of much more than narrowed eyes, and he was too tired to retort. Instead, he ducked under one of Pixie Bob's constructs and chewed off its leg. His massive horn glowed, and then fired off a beam of green energy that punched a hole through the construct's torso. The remains fell to the ground, only to reform into two smaller monsters, each shaped to look like an ogre out of a fantasy movie. Oh, great, Edel muttered, and then narrowly avoided a stream of tape. Whoa, sorry, Ciro called out. I tripped and shot in the wrong direction. Edel grumbled something that he would never have said even in his head before, but he was tired, and his self-control was fraying. That was another part of the training, though Aizawa would never tell any of the students. Heroes had to work through the most frustrating of circumstances, and the students needed to learn how they might react in the field on a really bad day. After fighting a dozen more constructs, the Ultimatrix timed out, and Midoriya fell to his knees. Hey, none of that, Pixie Bob said. Go for a run, and then come back here for push-ups, you know the drill by now. Why yes, ma'am. Midoriya hauled himself to his feet and started to run. How is he doing? Aizawa asked, once Midoriya was out of earshot. Well, he's determined, I'll give him that, Pixie Bob. His quirk is as much a challenge for us as it is for him. Half the stuff I threw at him was on the fly. Still, now we have a good read on him, and we came up with a training regimen after I confirmed some stuff this morning. Is there anything in particular you think he should work on? Pixie Bob shrugged. Nah, your file on him was good, it's less about power with him, and more about technique. Almost every one of his forms has a unique style, and he needs more experience. If he can polish everything he has to above average, he'll be in the top 20 his first year out of high school, no doubt about it. I'm not looking for above average skills, Aizawa said in no uncertain terms. I want my students to be the best. If you think Midoriya is better suited for learning technique over increasing his raw power, then go ahead. But I still want him exercising when he turns back to normal. You got it, Eraser. Pixie Bob squinted at Midoriya's distant form and frowned. He's slowing down. Maybe I should send one of my monsters to motivate him. Aizawa hid his smirk behind his capture tool. Whatever you think is best. That evening, the students had been given what they thought was a reprieve. They were allowed to stop the grueling training early and told to eat and get cleaned up. At first, even the most cynical of them thought that maybe this would be their chance to do something fun, like they'd hoped. Those thoughts were dashed when they saw the Pussycat Sands ragdoll waiting for them, each with an evil smile on their faces. Tonight, we'll be playing a fun little game, Pixie Bob said. We call it the test of courage. It's pretty simple, Tiger continued. Your two classes will be split up, and you'll pair off, one class will travel through the woods, and the other will do their best to scare the piss out of them. 
You get points for every team you scare, but the other team gets points if they don't freak out. Ragdoll will be at the halfway point on the route to give you your points. Think of her as the safe zone. That doesn't sound like fun at all, Ben muttered, and Midoriya silently agreed with him. Don't worry, you'll switch roles after the first round, so you'll be able to get some sweet revenge, Mandalay assured them all. Oh, and no causing physical harm, beyond that, anything goes. Yep, so you kittens can really see what you're made of. Pixie Bob grinned. Ragdoll will be keeping tabs on everyone with her quirk, so you won't have to worry about getting lost. Class B, you'll be doing the scaring first. Tiger pointed at the woods. Hair up, and move out. Not so fast, Aizawa said. Everyone who failed the exam will be coming with me for extra studying. If you're not brain dead by the time you're done, maybe you can spend an hour having fun before bed. He paused and did a quick head count. Shinso, Class B has an odd number, so you'll be filling in. Shinso nodded tiredly and shuffled over to Class B. The students who'd failed the test were dragged off, literally, in mind his case, as he complained that he'd had a plan to scare the pants off the girls, to study. The rising stars waved sadly as two of their number left. Okay, now that they're gone, everyone pair up, Mandalay ordered. We'll give Class B 10 minutes to get started, and then we'll release Class A to their tender mercies. Midoriya turned, but Uraraka already took his hand in hers. This isn't the moonlit walk I was hoping for, but it's something. Why yeah? Uraraka grinned. Don't worry, Deku-kun, I'll keep you safe. Midoriya blushed, and his friends laughed. They wouldn't do so again for a long time. Gabai sighed for what had to be the hundredth time in the last hour. Toga had been chomping at the bit to have her fun. But Shigaraki had been clear in his orders, they would move out only when it was completely dark out. Toga had tried to go early, but Dabai's stern orders and Slice's gentler approach kept the psychopath in line. Finally, the time had come. Let's go, Dabai said. Show these kids what real terror looks like. With the entertainment of teasing Midoriya over, the other rising stars paired up. Ida stood next to Yayarazu, and Ashido fist bumped Siro. The rest of Class 1 split up and got ready to move out. They waited until Class B had moved out into the woods and were then directed to go down different paths in staggered increments. So, what do you think they'll do to try and scare us? Uraraka asked as she and Midoriya walked. I'm not sure, Midoriya admitted. I don't know most of their quirks very well. I could see Shizaki-san tugging at us with her vines. That could be scary. Uraraka imagined the feeling of one of those vines wrapping around her ankle and shuddered. However, something happened that distracted her from the test. Um, Deku-kun. She pointed off to her left. Is that smoke? Sure enough, Midoriya could see a pillar of smoke rising in the distance. That's not from the campsite. It can't be Shoto. He's not taking this test. We would have heard Bakugo's explosions if it was him. It might be someone from Class B. But it's a terrible idea to use fire in a forest. You're pretty bright, kid. The unknown voice made the two tense, and it got worse when a woman stepped out of the shadows. As a reward for thinking so quickly, I'll give you a reward. It was my friend who started that fire, none of your classmates. WH who are you? Midoriya asked, hand drifting to the Ultimatrix. You can call me Slice, the woman said. She held out her gloved hands, each finger tipped with a long blade. Her hair, gleaming in a way similar to metal, rose in snake-like coils over her shoulders. I'm a member of the League of Villains. Midoriya's blood turned to ice. What was the League doing here? How did they find the training camp? Most importantly, what would he and Uraraka do now? W well, Slice, Midoriya said as he and Uraraka slowly backed up. I D don't suppose we see can T talk about this. Slice laughed. Oh, that's cute, Midoriya Izuku. If you were anyone else, I might even let you go just for making me laugh. She shrugged. Sadly, I have my orders, and they involve dragging you back to Shigaraki. How much pain you go through before that happens is entirely up to you. Midoriya swallowed nervously. After Hasu, he had always wondered if Shigaraki would try something again. It seemed his fears were justified. Izuku, Uraraka's voice shook, but she kept her eyes locked on Slice. You need to get to Aizawa Sensei and the Pussycats. He has to know about this, and you can get to them faster. B, e, but what about? I'll be fine. Uraraka's smile was wobbly, much like his own. I'll be right behind you. Midoriya knew that she wanted to buy time for him to warn the rest of the campers, and while he knew that that was the responsible thing to do, his brain and his heart had both decided nope at the exact same time. Heroes saved everyone, that had been a part of Midoriya's core belief since he first saw All Might on the internet, and he wasn't about to betray that value now. There was a flash of green light, and then Uraraka was in XLR8's arms. Hold on tight, he said, and by the time Slice's hair lashed out, it only hit empty air. Not that it mattered to Slice, capture had never been something she'd been good at. Torture, pain, and death were her skills, she could have attacked while they'd been talking. 
but she was certain that they would lead her to even more targets. Humming softly to herself, she followed the trail XLR8 left behind. When he heard screams in the distance, Ida pushed his glasses further up on his face. It seems that Class B has already started. Yeyorazu strained to identify the screams. I think that last one was Mina. If she could be so easily scared, why did she want to hear ghost stories? Maybe she just does not like jump scares. Ida looked anywhere but Yeyorazu, which she found adorable. I admit that I am not fond of them either. Yeyorazu would have teased him, but she was too busy staring at the knife that was suddenly buried in her shoulder. Then the pain registered through the shock, and she cried out. Momo. Ida tried to catch her as she stumbled back. A new voice giggled in the darkness. Ooh, you have a beautiful scream. Can I hear it again? Yeyorazu drew in a sharp breath as her hand went to the wound. Blood dripped through her fingers, and an ecstatic gasp could be heard. You look even prettier when you're bleeding. It makes me want to cut you more. Ida stood protectively in front of Yeyorazu as Toga stepped into view. Who are you? Why are you attacking us? Toga tapped her mask with one finger and tilted her herd. Ooh, you're handsome too, and I'll bet you'll look even better when I slice you open. She paused. Wait a second I know you. You're one of the people Mr. Staney attacked before he got caught. Ida narrowed his eyes, while behind him on the ground, Yeyorazu created some bandages for her shoulder. You're a follower of that madman. Never met him before, Toga admitted. But he's the reason I joined the League of Villains, so I guess you could say he's my hero. He's no hero, Ida spat. He's a murdering monster that doesn't deserve the title of hero. Tenya, we need to go, Yeyorazu said as she got back to her feet. We have to get to Aizawa Sensei and the other pros. Toga slid two more knives out from inside her sleeves. Not so fast, pretty girl. I don't want to kill you, but I really want to see just how pretty I can make you before you can't scream anymore. Yeyorazu leaned closer to Ida so that she could whisper. Flashbang in five seconds, then run. Ida didn't take his eyes off Toga, but nodded. He counted to five in his head, then closed his eyes. He heard the sound of the flashbang going off, and then Yeyorazu jumped onto his back. Run for it, Tenya. Rather than reply, Ida poured everything he had into a recipro extend and blew past Toga. He knew better than to pick a fight with a villain armed with bladed weapons when he wasn't prepared. Hey, that's cheating. Ida heard a whistling noise, and then a meaty thud somewhere close. Momo, are you alright? I'm fine. Yeyorazu called back, her voice strained. Just run. She just wanted him to keep going. She didn't need to distract him with the second knife in her back. Kanto duck. Ashido threw a glob of acid that landed at twice his feet. It threw off his aim with his wrist-mounted bladed tape measure, which would have taken off Siro's ear, if not his whole head. Oh, crap. Siro swung himself onto a tree branch, then used another strand of tape to pull Ashido up with him. What's going on? How did the League even find us? That's a good question, kid. Twice shouted. Too bad I'll never tell. This guy's nuts, Ashido whispered, trembling in fear. She had no idea where Kendo and Tetsu Tetsu had gone. They had gotten separated when Twice showed up in the middle of the Class B students scaring them. We have to get back to camp, Siro said, his voice shook. But his arms were steady as he helped Ashido. It'll be easier if we stay in the trees. Why yeah, you're right. Ashido bit her lip. It'll be hard to find our way in the dark. We came from that direction. Siro pointed behind him. How can you tell? The moon was in front of us when we started. Oh, smart. Thanks. Siro grabbed Ashido again and swung to another tree, just as twice cut away the branch they'd been standing on. Come on, let's go. Does anyone smell something, Ribbit? Monoma tore his attention away from his worksheet to sneer at Asui. Aside from the reek of Class A's failure. No. Todoroki almost glared at the 1B student. But it occurred to him that Asui wouldn't have made a comment like that when they were supposed to be studying unless it was important. He inhaled deeply and immediately recognized that the smell of fire and smoke was a constant in his house, even when Endeavor wasn't around. Vlad King, an experienced hero with honed instincts, also knew what it was. Everyone, get down. The door to the study hall exploded inward, but Vlad King used his quirk, blood control, to create a wall of solid crimson his own blood, now hard as stone. The door shattered upon impact, the pieces falling to the ground still burning with blue fire. Not bad, Dabai said as he strode inside, clapping slowly. Those reflexes are no joke. That's a lot of blood you just used, but you're still standing, I guess you just replenish it instantly, huh? Rather than waste time talking, Vlad King just grunted as he fired an enormous wave of blood. Dabai met it with a torrent of blue fire from one hand. What resulted was a mass of red steam that filled the room with the smell of iron. Todoroki knew fire better than anyone else in the room. It was practically instinctive, especially after he had decided to use his left side. 
he knew almost instantly that Dabai was leagues ahead of him when it came to fire, even if he didn't know his name. He had to leave this to Vlad King, whose experience and nature of his quirk would hopefully match Dabai's raw power. Get behind me, Todoroki snapped, and created a wall of ice between the fighters and his classmates. The heat from the steam was balanced by the cold of the ice, so Asui wasn't terribly affected. She was the calmest as she stood beside Todoroki, ready to move if necessary. Kaminari sparked with electricity out of reflex, and Gyro's jacks waved back and forth. Hiroshima had hardened his entire body, ready to shield anyone who needed it. Surprisingly to those who knew him, Minda had one of his balls ready to throw, and though he shook like a leaf, his eyes were as steely as any pro hero. Todoroki felt a tap on his arm. He turned and saw Monoma, whose right arm was dusted with frost exactly like his own quirk. I can copy the quirk of anyone I touch, Monoma explained, only a trace of haughtiness left in his tone. If one ice-related quirk can help, then two will be even better. Of course, all their preparations were rendered pointless. Aizawa burst into the room, his quirk erasing dab eyes in an instant. As soon as the blue fire died out, Vlad King charged in and grabbed dab eye by the face and slammed him into the nearest wall. Kinda brutal, don't you think? Dab eye grunted. I thought heroes were supposed to have restraint. You put the lives of innocent students in jeopardy with that little Lycho, Vlad King growled. I'm within my authority to break every bone in your body. Too bad I'm not the one you really want. To everyone's shock, Dabai started to melt like a candle, until he was reduced to a gray puddle on the floor. Eraser. Vlad King glared at the other teacher. What happened? How come you didn't erase his other quirk? That wasn't his quirk. Eraser had realized as he put on his goggles. Someone, another villain, made a copy of the real one and sent it here. It was a distraction. We need to get outside and call for help, Vlad King said, and then glanced at the students. What about them? They'll come with us, Eraser had decided. Outside is better than being trapped in a building that might get burned down. He paused for a moment. Todoroki, use your ice to take care of any fire Vlad doesn't put out. Monoma, you've already copied his quirk, so you get to help him. Everyone, if we run into more villains, leave them to us. Only fight if you have no means of escape. Aizawa sensei, what about our classmates? Gyro pointed to the window, where pillars of smoke could be seen rising from the trees. Are they going to be okay? Aizawa sighed, and he seemed to age ten years in an instant. Right now, I don't know. Understandably turned around by what had just happened, Midoriya and Yuraka accidentally went further up the trail, and ended up running right into Ragdoll, and tumbled to the ground. Whoa, kittens, what's going on? Ragdoll helped up Yuraka as Midoriya turned back to normal. You couldn't have gotten scared by the others that badly. Villains, Midoriya interrupted. The League of Villains is here. Ragdoll was an experienced hero, and there were a few things you didn't lie about. Fires in movie theaters, medical emergencies, and villain attacks. Her cheerful smile dropped away, and she closed her eyes. Her quirk, search, allowed her to track up to 100 people at once and know their weaknesses. She hadn't known about the villains because she hadn't been actively looking for them. Now that she wasn't just focusing on the students, she knew Midoriya was telling the truth. Okay, kittens, you stay with me, she said, her tone deadly serious. We'll head back to camp, gather up anyone else we come across, and then the other pros and I will grab anyone we owe no. Even in the darkness, Midoriya could see how pale she was. Ragdoll, what is it? It's Koda. She pointed at the nearby mountain. He's at his hiding spot, and two of the villains are close by. Midoriya stepped forward. I can get him. Uraraka could tell from the way he blinked after speaking that her boyfriend had just volunteered for something dangerous without thinking. You're not going anywhere without me, she said, but Ragdoll put a hand on her shoulder. With her other hand, the pussycat rubbed the back of her neck. I am going to be in so much trouble for this okay, Midoriya, you can go, but you only have permission to fight if you have no other options. Just get Koda and get out. Am I clear? Midoriya nodded. Yes, ma'am. Ragdoll gave Uraraka a sympathetic look. He has to do this fast, and that's a lot harder when he's taking someone with him, and we don't have time to discuss it. You can help me gather up the other kittens. Uraraka reluctantly nodded, and then turned to Midoriya. Be careful, Deku-kun. You too. A flash of green light later, and Jetre flew off in Koda's direction. I'll be back soon. Uraraka watched him go for a moment, but she had barely taken a step back in the direction of camp when Ragdoll stopped her again. Uraraka-chan, be ready to move, she said. We've got company. Well, that's not very polite, Slice pretended to pout. I like to announce my own entrance. You've made a pretty bad decision, Ragdoll said as she slowly moved Uraraka closer to the trees. You can look forward to a long stay in Tartarus for this. Slice just smirked. 
Oh, the League is reaching heights of power that can't be contained by your little prison. Soon enough, we'll be ruling a country that's been plunged into darkness. I think we'll have to say no to that. Ragdoll raised her paws, and Steel Claws popped out of the gloves. Slice lifted her own hands, and Moonlight glinted off the blades. My claws are bigger than yours, Kitty. Ragdoll tried to leap backwards with Uraraka, but Slice's hair lashed out, cutting the nearest trees into kindling. My hair can cut through solid stone, Slice boasted. All I have to do is hit you once. Then we won't let that happen. Ragdoll was amazingly calm during this, her eyes darting around as she looked for the best move to make. Uraraka, keep moving. I'll handle this. Slice tried to impale Ragdoll on her hair, but the pussycat nimbly flipped over the attack and then rushed in close. She ducked under Slice's blades and raked her claws across the other woman's leg. Don't underestimate a cat. No matter how cute she looks, Ragdoll taunted, holding up the paw that now dripped blood. We tend to scratch when we're annoyed. Slice hissed in pain. Her hair split into a dozen tendrils that lashed out almost at random. Ragdoll twisted, flipped and spun, barely able to avoid getting hit. It became almost like a dance, but with one of them unconscious or dead by the end. Both women were so focused on the fight that Uraraka realized no one was paying any attention to her. She crept around as quietly as possible, until she saw an opportunity too good to pass up Slice's back was to her, and her hair was too far forward to be a threat. I could make her float, and then Ragdoll can end this. Uraraka nodded to herself. I can do this, this is what I've been training for. Ragdoll saw Uraraka move, and her eyes went wide. No, don't. Slice, aware of the girl's intentions ever since leaving her sight, smiled cruelly. A cord of hair flipped around and fell like an axe. Uraraka felt the pain, saw the blood, and screamed. At that moment, Jetre really wished he could move someone quickly without risking harm because he wanted nothing more than to snatch Koda out of there and fly like hell back to camp. Standing in front of the little boy were two giants, one looked like a professional bodybuilder, with short blonde hair and a horrible scar over one side of his face, and the other looked more like something Midoriya would turn into, with a wolf's head, bird-like talons for hands, and a reptilian tail. Jetre could have just grabbed Koda and tried to fly away, but there were two problems. First, he had no idea what the villains were capable of. For all he knew, they could rip him in half just by looking at him, especially if he was busy trying to get Koda to safety while flying slowly enough that he wouldn't endanger him. The second problem was that Koda would probably get completely freaked out if a flying manta bat swooped in and grabbed him. He might struggle and fall in midair. That left him with another choice stay and fight until the villains couldn't get up, or fight long enough to figure out a way to safely extract Koda. But, as the bodybuilder reached out to grab the boy, Midoriya knew he didn't have any more time to think. He slapped the dial as he flew down, but the Ultimatrix chose that moment to malfunction. Just because Ben's life expectancy had been extended didn't mean the watch wasn't still damaged. Instead of NRG as he'd intended, Water Hazard landed between Coda and the villains, but he made do with what he had and blasted both criminals with torrents of water. The men were driven back a few feet, but their own incredible strength resisted the pressure. There was also another problem with the water hitting them. Water Hazard was unable to clearly see what they were doing, so he was caught by surprise when an arm covered in muscle fibers punched through the water and smashed him in the chest. Please, is that all you've got, kid? Muscular sneered. I was hit worse by those heroes I killed a while back. Water Hazard had been so focused on just keeping Coda safe that it was only now that he recognized Muscular for who he was. A small part of him that wasn't focused on the fight felt terrible for Coda. No one should be powerless in the face of their parents' killer. He tried to touch the Ultimatrix dial, but Chimera rushed in and grabbed his arm. Muscular, remember the plan. This is the kid Shigaraki warned us about. Right, right. Muscular clotheslined Water Hazard and then Chimera heaved him over his shoulder to slam him into the ground. Even if we keep him from transforming, I thought he'd put up more of a fight. They know what they're doing, Water Hazard realized with no small amount of fear. They can beat me if they don't let me turn into something with better chances. WH what are you doing? Koda demanded, eyes full of tears. You're Jay just you gonna get killed. I'm going to be a hero. Water Hazard forced himself to his feet. If the villains weren't going to give him the opportunity to transform, then he would just use what he had. I'm going to save you, Koda no matter what. Later on, Mandalay would wonder how things had gone so wrong. 
Villains had been the last thing she'd expected to deal with when training 21 would be heroes. Of course, when she would think about that, she would berate herself for being lax. Being a hero meant walking a fine line between preparedness and paranoia. But the pussycat's property had been so off the beaten path that Mandalay had considered it truly safe. Now, as she narrowly avoided Spinner's wild swings, the idea of safety was well and truly gone. She only hoped that Coda wasn't in any danger. She made a promise then and there to never let anything happen to him ever again. Stay still, you fake. Spinner yelled. Like staying before me, I will purge you and your kind from the world. Mandalay forced herself to maintain a cocky smile. Stain this, stain that, are you ever going to say something original? With a wordless shout of rage, Spinner swung at her again. His weapon was a bundle of swords and long knives, tied together and attached to a long handle. It was clumsy and ridiculous, but it would still tear her apart if he hit her. Thankfully, Spinner wasn't very experienced, and his sword was unwieldy, so Mandalay had little difficulty avoiding his swings. Tiger was in a bit of a stalemate against his opponent, a woman calling herself Magni. She had used her quirk, which made people magnetic and could draw them in close, in combination with an enormous magnetic pole to knock Pixie Bob unconscious. Mandalay had seen the devastating blow to her friend's head, and was honestly worried about a serious concussion, or even brain damage. Thankfully, Tiger had intervened before Magni could finish off Pixie Bob. Magni was skilled enough in hand-to-hand -hand combat to avoid getting knocked out but Tiger's quirk allowed him to dodge all of her attacks. Come on, is that the best you heroes can do? Magni taunted. I thought you were supposed to be strong. Tiger just laughed. You think strength is all about defeating the enemy. Being a hero means having the strength to show mercy. I can keep this up all day, but I can see you sweating like a pig. Who are you calling a pig? You, you? Magni dropped her magnet and threw a wild punch. Good, Tiger has her distracted, Mandalay thought. As long as we keep their attention off Pixie Bob, we have a chance. Now we just need Ragdoll to show up. As if summoned by her thoughts, the fourth member of the team came barreling onto the scene. Just as Eraserhead, Vlad King, and students from several directions arrived. Oh crap. Spinner jumped back, eyes flitting around nervously. Magni, I think we have a problem. I can see that, honey, but we've got our own backup on the way. Mandalay barely heard the villains talk. She was too busy staring in horror. Ragdoll had several gashes on her back, but most of the blood covering her wasn't her own. She carried a pale, blood-soaked body in her arms, Uraraka Achako. The poor girl's breath hitched, the only sign of life, and Mandalay was positive she'd gone into shock. She wasn't surprised. Uraraka's right arm was completely gone, and only desperate pressure from Ragdoll's glove kept her from bleeding out already. There was a scream from one of the students. Mandalay wasn't sure who, as they saw what had happened to Uraraka. Eraserhead, I need your scarf. Ragdoll shouted. If we don't stop the bleeding now, we're going to lose her. Eraser had barely paused to take in Uraraka's injuries. We can't stop that with what we have. Todoroki, who had gone so pale that his burn almost seemed to glow, stepped forward on shaky legs. What? What if I cauterize it? Mandalay considered it. Uraraka needed a hospital and a full medical team. But by the time she got either, she'd be long dead. Todoroki's option was crude. But it might save her life. Do it, Mandalay ordered. Eraser, hold her still, Vlad, help Tiger. Students, you have my permission to engage the enemy as necessary. Hiroshima stood guard as Ragdoll practically collapsed with Uraraka. Todoroki knelt next to his friend and held his left hand to where her shoulder used to be. Achako, can you hear me? To Todoroki's relief, Uraraka nodded weakly. This is going to hurt. I'm sorry. Eraserhead took part of his scarf and held it in Uraraka's mouth to bite on, and then held her down as gently as possible. Flames burst from Todoroki's hand in a short stream, blood hissed and burned away, and the smell of charred flesh made everyone feel sick. Uraraka tried to stay still, but instinct made her struggle in Eraserhead's grip. After a minute of cauterizing, Todoroki leaned back, Uraraka's wound no longer bled, but there was an ugly patch of red where her shoulder once was. Momo, Todoroki and Eraserhead both looked up to see Ida, who had arrived on the scene at the same time as them. Hold Yeyurazu in his arms. He looked horrified as he beheld a knife buried almost to the hilt in her back. It's and not not that bad, Yeyurazu said through clenched teeth. How's Achako? She'll be fine, Todoroki said, even though he knew she was anything but fine. Even if she didn't die from her injuries, she had lost an arm. Mandalay was having similar thoughts. The camp was compromised, and students needed medical attention. Thankfully, with Vlad King and Monoma using his copy of Todoroki's quirk, helping Tiger, the villains were falling back. That gave Mandalay the chance she needed to call for help. 
This is Mandalay of the Wild, Wild Pussycats, calling in a code red, she said into her communicator. We are under attack by the League of Villains, students are in danger, and we have multiple casualties, requesting immediate assistance. Thankfully, the hero network was automatically triggered by keywords like villains and casualties. Within minutes, every hero agency in 500 miles would be heading their way, along with police and paramedics. Mandalay just hoped that they arrived before it was too late. Hanta, what's that? Ashido pointed at a growing purple cloud to their right. Ciro narrowed his eyes. Not sure. It could be someone from Class B, or a villain attacking someone. Do we do we help, or should we keep heading back to camp? What kind of heroes would we be if we ignored someone who needs us? Ciro smiled. But even in the darkness, Ashido could see how afraid he was. Come on, let's go. Ciro swung from one branch to another, while Ashido used her natural athleticism to follow close behind. When they reached the outskirts of the cloud, they were horrified to see several students from both classes on the ground, including Shoji, Koda and Hagakure. Guys, are you okay? Ashido landed gracefully and ran over to them. Only Shoji was still conscious, but only just. Ashido run. Siro knelt to check Koda and Hagakure. They're breathing. They're alive. Villain Shoji weakly pointed into the purple fog creates poison. Kendo and Tetsu Tetsu ran in to save others. Crap, Ashido muttered. What do we do? Before Siro could answer, they heard ragged coughing, and Kendo staggered out of the poison. She carried two of her classmates in one giant hand, and Ayama in the other. Behind her, Tetsu Tetsu held Shizaki. Hey, guys, Kendo said weakly, and then fell over. Oh, that sucked. You just ran into a cloud of poison. Siro helped drag them further away from the fog. How did you last so long? Tetsu Tetsu grinned. We held our breath, and Kendo waved away a lot with her quirk. Still breathed in some of that crap, but it wasn't as bad. I saw. Kendo coughed for a second. I saw the villain in there. He's a kid, looks like a middle schooler, school uniform, and a gas mask. He's also got a gun. Tetsu Tetsu grimaced and pointed to his sleeve, which now sported a hole. Good thing I used my quirk in time. We can't get everyone out before he catches us with more poison. Kendo coughed again. If we could just get rid of that cloud, we could take him down. Ashido and Siro looked at each other, they were the only ones in any shape to fight, but neither of them were suited to taking down a living chemical weapon. Siro looked up at the sky, partially hidden by the trees, and tried to think of something. Wait a second, Kendo used her quirk to blow away some of the gas. The trees. Siro looked around him, and then at the fog that crept closer. Mina, I think I have an idea, but I need your help. Mustard strode almost idly at the center of his own poison. He was disappointed that the handful of hero hopefuls he'd caught had been rescued, but they had all inhaled enough of his quirk to be put out of commission for a while. He still had plenty of opportunities ahead of him. With the air as still as it was, his poison wouldn't be blown away anytime soon. Let's see Mustard look to his left. Those newcomers dragged off the others in that direction. They probably think they'll be safer at the camp. Too bad for them, their base is already under attack. He shrugged. I wouldn't be surprised if we have a little showdown there. Maybe I'll catch a pro in my quirk. I won't have to hold back against one of them. A noise caught his attention. It didn't sound like footsteps or heavy breathing, but more like something flying through the air. It was outside the edge of his quirk, so he couldn't track its precise location, and since his quirk blocked his own sight, he couldn't see it. Then he heard a new sound a strange hissing, followed by a loud creak. Timber, someone shouted. That was the only warning Mustard had before an entire tree fell into his poison. The sudden blast of air from the impact blew away a large portion of the cloud, briefly exposing the young villain. Gotcha, punk. A line of tape lashed out, trapping his arms to his sides. He was reeled in, and his face connected with a pink fist at an impressive velocity. His mask cracked, and he saw stars for a moment. What just happened? Mustard wondered, even as he created more poison. Doesn't matter, I'll just force them back long enough to free myself. They're too close not to get caught in my quirk. No you don't. Ciro fired tape from his other elbow and dragged himself to a tree, taking Mustard along with him. Unable to stay still long enough to gather a sufficient amount of his quirk, Mustard only trailed a few toxic vapors behind him. Hanta, drop him. The pink girl who had punched him lunged as Mustard fell to the ground. Her hand, now coated in acid, grabbed the front of his gas mask, metal and plastic hissed as it melted away, and Mustard screamed in pain as some of the acid dripped onto his face. The last thing he saw was Ashido's foot as it connected with his head. 
You know, part of me was hoping that this was just some short guy with a weird obsession with middle school uniforms, Ashido said as she ripped off one of Mustard's sleeves and used it to wipe away the acid droplets on his face. It would have been creepier, but seeing a kid act like this is just depressing. The plan had been simple, but, to Siro and Ashido's relief, very effective. Ashido had used her acid at the base of a tree, and Siro had guided its fall with layered strands of tape. Once the air kicked up by the leaves and branches blew away enough of the poison, Siro had reeled mustard out, where Ashido had finished the job. Siro was just glad that they had been fighting in an environment that allowed him to capitalize on his quirk and his maneuverability. If the fight had taken place in an open area, like the sports festival, they wouldn't have stood a chance. Yeah, I hear you. Siro added a few layers of tape around the boy, just to be safe. Nice kick, though. Thanks. Ashido chuckled. Did we just take down a villain by ourselves? Technically, yeah. Ciro's own laughter was laced with anxiety. First USJ, then I Island, and now this. If we're not careful, they're gonna start calling us vigilantes. Nah, we'll have good press on our side. We can be underground heroes, like Aizawa Sensei. Ashido saw Kendo slowly get up and wave at them. Speaking of Aizawa Sensei, we should help get everyone back to camp. Good idea, my, Ciro was cut off by a fit of coughing. Oh, crap. I think I breathed in some of the poison. Ashido turned a shade lighter. Okay, let's try to get to camp quickly. Siro nodded. I just hope the others are doing okay. Yeyurazu tried not to whimper in pain. Every breath caused a fresh spike of agony, and the slightest movement made her feel like her flesh was being torn open again. Without proper medical treatment, removing the knives from her body, especially the one in her back, which might be touching an organ, could cause even more damage, so she was forced to keep them where they were. Todoroki was nearby, providing ice to help reduce the pain, if only a little. He and the other students remained on guard around her, Yuraraka and Ragdoll, who was barely conscious at that point. Thinking about Yuraraka made Yeyurazu's stomach twist even more than the pain and fear. She tried not to look at where her arm used to be, but her gaze kept getting drawn to the injury in some morbid fascination. She just couldn't quite process that her friend was so badly hurt. Her career as a hero is over before it started. Yeyurazu would have slapped herself if she hadn't needed to stay still. Forget her career, I'll just be happy if she survives. She slowly reached over and took Yuraraka's remaining hand in her own. Asui noticed and worriedly glanced over. Is she still you know? Yeyurazu nodded. She still has a pulse. That's, that's good. Asui was more rattled than anyone had ever seen though she was still more composed than most of the students. A noise that didn't come from the distant fighting caught everyone's attention. Hiroshima hardened, Todoroki's fire flared up, and Kaminari's whole body sparked with electricity before they all realized that it was a handful of 1B students, as well as Bakugo and Takoyami. The latter two had several cuts and bruises, but nothing serious. Ida, who had basically taken charge of the students by that point, jogged over. What happened? Bakugo scoffed. Some creepy asshole in a straight jacket and fucked up teeth tried to kill us and these class B extras. Birdman over here went nuts and beat the shit out of the guy, and then he tried to kill us. Ida stared at Takoyami, who looked away, shamefaced. If you recall from the exam, Dark Shadow can sometimes run wild in the dark. I lost control after fighting that villain. Fortunately, Bakugo was able to create enough light to subjugate Dark Shadow. What he said. Bakugo glanced over at the other class of students, and his eyes went wide when he saw Yuraraka. The fuck happened to Round Face? Another villain, Ida said tersely. Vandalay has already called for help, but Achako needs a doctor. Bakugo nodded, and then did a quick head count. Still missing about half our class, and most of the extras. And where the fuck is Deku? I figured he'd have some freaky power to fix this shit. Yeyurazu, who had been half listening to the exchange, tightened her grip on Yuraraka when Midoriya was mentioned. Ragdoll sent him to recover Koda, Ida explained. We do not know anything else. Yeyurazu shut her eyes. For his sake and ours, I hope he's okay. Koda flinched as water hazard crashed into the ground, which cracked from the impact. That was the fifth time his would-be protector had been hit like that, and it was taking him longer and longer to get to his feet each time. At least that shell is good for something, muscular taunted. I can smack you around as much as I want. Not too much, Chimera warned, and then kicked Water Hazard's hand away from the dial on his chest. We need him alive. You say that one more time, and you'll be the one not macking it out alive, Dogman. 
water hazard aimed one palm and shot a jet of water into Muscular's leg, which wasn't protected by his quirk. Muscular was sent sprawling, but he quickly recovered. Water Hazard took the opportunity to focus on Chimera, but the other villain powered through the torrents of water and grabbed him by the face. I said we had to bring you in alive, Chimera snarled. That doesn't mean you have to be brought back in one piece. Kota felt tears well up as he watched Midoriya get slammed into the ground over and over. Just stop it. He's going to kill you. Water Hazard curled up and kicked out, landing a solid hit on Chimera's snout that made him let go. He then fired stronger jets of water at both villains, holding them back for a moment. I told you water hazard said, his shell cracked and leaking blue blood. I told you I'd keep you safe, and that's what I'm going to do. Muscular forced his way through the water again and grabbed water hazard by the arm. There was a horrible crunch, followed by a scream of pain. Water hazard's right arm fell limply to his side. The shell around his forearm crushed like a soda can. Midoriya would have loved to turn into a different alien, especially Swampfire to heal his wounds, but the villains were prepared. Even Muscular, for all that he was a psychotic killer, kept a close eye on his hands, always moving to keep him from transforming. A part of him was genuinely scared that he would be beaten and taken by the League. The rest of him was focused on what he had to do, save Koda. At that moment, that was all he could think about. With his good arm, he fired another stream of water that caught Muscular in the face, he hadn't pulled his muscle fibers over that weak spot, and was knocked over once again. When he got up, he spat out water and a bloody tooth. Of course, Water Hazard paid for that when Chimera drove his fist into his side. His shell cracked again, and the strength left his legs. He fell on his back, and was barely able to raise his head. Finally, Muscular cracked his knuckles and stood over him. I don't suppose the boss'll mind if I beat this oversized lobster a bit before we hand him over. Chimera shrugged. Just don't kill him. Kota Water Hazard weakly turned his head. The boy was shaking like a leaf and hadn't moved since the fight began. Run just run. Get somewhere safe. Muscular's arm grew several times larger as he focused his muscle fibers and drew his fist back to crush Water Hazard, who closed his eyes in anticipation of pain. Get away from him. Water Hazard's eyes snapped open. There, standing between him and the villains with his arms spread wide, was Ben. From the way the villains paused, they could see and hear him, and Water Hazard wondered what he was doing. Sorry, buddy, but I can't stand by any longer. Ben turned his head and smiled, even as tears dripped down his face. Ben, what? Hyper evolutionary feature unlocked. Ben placed his hand on the Ultimatrix dial. Go be a hero, buddy. I believe in you. No, wait. Ben twisted the dial, and then tapped it. With a final smile, he vanished in a cloud of pixels. The villains shared a cautious glance as Water Hazard disappeared in a flash of green light, and Ultimate Water Hazard stood up. He was slightly taller now, with grey armor replacing the red. His arms now ended in enormous pincers. His carapace was dotted by barnacle-like nozzles that continuously streamed out water, and on his back was something that looked like a rocket. You just made the biggest mistake of your lives, Ultimate Water Hazard said. His voice echoed like it was coming from underwater. And I'm going to make you regret it. Finally, a real fight. Muscular charged, muscle fibers curling around him like armor. He took about three steps. In that time, Ultimate Water Hazard pointed one claw at him and fired a geyser of water that tore away all of the fibers on his right side and sent him spinning like a top. That was for the water hose. Another blast of high-pressure water smashed Muscular into and through a rock. Even Chimera flinched at the sound of shattered bone. That was for Koda. Without even looking, Ultimate Water Hazard aimed his other claw at Chimera and clipped his shoulder with enough force to dislocate it. And that was for my best friend. At that point, Chimera no longer cared about bringing Midoriya in alive. Ultimate Water Hazard was too powerful not to attack with lethal force. His muscles bulged, feathers sprouted from his forearms, and horns popped out from his head. You think you're the only one with a second level of power. He shouted. This is why people fear me. He opened his mouth and fired a beam of heat that carved a hole in the side of the mountain. Few people in the world could withstand that kind of power, and for a moment, Chimera thought he had vaporized the kid and he sighed in relief as he wiped away the rain on his face. Wait rain. That wasn't rain. Chimera looked up and saw Ultimate Water Hazard hovering in the air. A continuous jet of water from his back was letting him fly. Before Chimera could fire off another beam, Ultimate Water Hazard twisted so that he was aimed at him and stretched out his claws. Water erupted from the barnacles, surrounding him in a churning vortex. More water shot out from his jetpack, and he rocketed towards Chimera. Aqua crash. The impact shattered stone 
and Chimera felt his ribs snap. He had tried to brace himself for the impact, and that had just resulted in broken legs. As the water dispersed and rained down around them, Chimera could barely move in the crater made in the solid stone. Yukimira coughed, and blood splattered against the alien, which was quickly washed away. You're just a kid. Ultimate Water Hazard reached out and grabbed him by the face. No, I'm not. I'm a hero. Chimera had just enough time to appreciate how easily he was lifted out of the crater, and then he was slammed headfirst into the ground, and everything went black. Midoriya didn't feel any sort of rush from using a new ultimate. In fact, he didn't feel anything at all. It was like he was in a dream, and nothing felt real. Then, you can turn the ultimates off again, right? There was no answer, and he looked down at the ultimatrix dial. Then, instead of the reassuring voice of his friend, there was a loud crackle. Error, error, emergency reversion in process. Midoriya blinked as he suddenly changed back to water hazard, and then his regular human self. As soon as he did so, he was nearly overwhelmed by pain. He didn't need a doctor to tell him that his right forearm was broken in several places, and his ribs definitely felt like they were in places they shouldn't have been. Blood poured down from a cut on his head and several on his torso, and one eye was swollen shut. It's fine, he muttered to himself, I'll just turn into swamp fire, and I'll be good as new. I wouldn't do that, if I were you. Midoriya froze, and then turned to see a man in an orange and black suit, an elaborately patterned white mask, and a black top hat standing not too far away. Just in front of him was a terrified Koda. The villain had one hand wrapped around the back of the boy's neck. I must admit, I'm surprised that a mere student defeated both Chimera and Muscular. The man used his free hand to sweep off his hat and give an abbreviated bow. As a showman myself, I applaud any performance that subverts my expectations. Midoriya did his best to remain steady on his feet, and forced his broken arm to hover over the Ultimatrix. Let, Koda, go. Dear boy, I have every intention to do just that. The villain placed his hat back on his head. As soon as you surrender, of course, I do need some kind of insurance, after all. Midoriya didn't blink. You'll let him go if I surrender. I'm a man of my word. There was no real choice. Even if Midoriya wasn't injured, a child's life was not something he was willing to risk. Fine. Midoriya slowly raised his hands. Let him go. Mr. Compress gently nudged Koda towards the path. Go on, child. Go tell the heroes that your savior has been captured. Koda paused and looked at Midoriya, who did his best to smile. I'm not going to die, Koda. I promise. Compress held one hand over Midoriya's head but waited until Koda was gone before speaking. Quite noble of you. I respect that. Thanks, I guess. Midoriya was thrown off a bit by how polite the man was. I suppose I should take Chimera with me as well. Compress side. He, at least, can follow orders. Muscular is a brute who just wants to kill everyone he sees. The police can have him. What about me? Midoriya asked. What does Shigaraki want with me? Midoriya could almost hear the smile in Compress voice. Who said anything about Shigaraki wanting you? Then there was a flash of light, and Midoriya knew no more. I just got the signal, time to go. Toga looked up from her work and pouted. Oh, come on. We just got here. Twice has a couple of my clones running around to cause a diversion. Dab I said. We'll never get a better opportunity to get out of here. Besides, we already lost Mustard, Moonfish and Muscular. If we lose anyone else, Shigaraki will annoy us with his bitching. Wait, Mustard got taken. Toga drooped. Off, man. I like the kid. Same. But apparently, the pros are too close for us to try getting him back. Dabai glanced over his shoulder at the battered Magni and Spinner. I could have tried, but I had to save these idiots. Toga sighed and stood up. What about Slice and Twice? Extracted with Kirajiri, along with Compress and Chimera. I'd be gone by now, but I had to find you. All right, fine. Toga checked to see that the blood she'd taken from Yuroraka's severed arm was secure. Hey, this Midoriya kid, he's cute, right? How should I know? Dabai rolled his eyes. Maybe you can see for yourself before Shigaraki hands him over to the other guy. Why didn't you say so? Let's go. Auntie Shino. Mandalay's ears perked up at the sound of her nephew's voice. Koda, Koda, half blinded by tears, barreled into his aunt, who scooped him up into her arms. Th they took him. Who? Mandalay glanced around. At that point, most of the students had made their way back to camp and Ragdoll was guiding Tiger through Mandalay's quirk to the rest. 
who was taken, and Midoriya. He saved me from the villain who K killed mom and dad, but he was hurt, and then another guy took him. Mandalay heard a sob from behind her, Ashido, who had been barely holding it together since she'd seen Uraraka, fell to her knees. Around her, Midoriya's other friends sat down hard, some started to cry, while others simply shut down, not displaying any emotion whatsoever. Mandalay knew that they were just holding it in, and it would be even worse when that dam finally broke. The racer head, hands shoved into his pockets, sighed tiredly. More pros should be here any minute. Once we have the situation here fully under control, we can work on finding Midoriya. Mandalay nodded. I just hope the kid's okay. So do I, Eraser had muttered. Everything passed like a blur for the students. Pro heroes swarmed the camp and surrounding forest in a vain attempt to find Midoriya. They did secure mustard, as well as the battered moonfish and muscular. But the latter two were in no condition to be questioned, and mustard refused to answer to any field interrogation. The next thing they knew, the students were whisked away to a prestigious Tokyo hospital, where they received the best care available. Most of those who needed medical attention suffered from poisoning, but a doctor's quirk called Antidote quickly counteracted it. After that, they needed rest. Others, like Bakugo, Takoyami, and a few Class B students, needed stitches for some bad cuts. The worst two were Yeyurazu and Yuraraka, though the former's condition came in distant second to the latter. Yuraraka wasn't even on the same floor as them. She was being treated for massive blood loss, as well as terrible burns, though Todoroki had been assured that it had been a necessary move on his part to save her life. That didn't make him feel any better, and he sat on a hospital bed hugging his legs to his chest and his forehead resting on his knees. Ashido sat next to him, one arm hugging him close. Those who weren't too injured were questioned, first by the heroes on the scene, and then by the police in greater depth. It mostly involved describing the villains, their quirks, and what actions were taken against them. No one was quite sure whether it was out of loyalty to their teachers or the honest truth, but the students went out of their way to praise the actions of Eraserhead, Vlad King, and the Pussycats. They were sure to emphasize how, once the teachers arrived on the scene, no one else was hurt, Ragdoll was given the most credit, as she had taken several bad hits getting Uraraka back alive. Those same students surprised the police with questions of their own mostly about Midoriya. Even Class B was worried about him, and most of them had never even spoken to him. Unfortunately, all they got was the same answer that the police and the heroes were doing everything they could to find him. I can't handle this anymore. Siro was still recovering, but he was strong enough to punch a wall in frustration. Izuku is out there, alone, with those villains. He could be hurt, he could be. Don't say it. Ashido interrupted, tears streaming down her cheeks. Don't you dare say it. Both of you, please stop. Yeyurazu had just come back from getting stitched up. Thankfully, the stab wound in her back had missed any vital organs and was resting fitfully. Right now, we have to leave this to the police and the pros. Hiroshima groaned. I just feel so useless. Those bastards took Midoriya, and all I did was stand there. None of us were even close to Midoriya or Uraraka when this happened. Takoyami reminded them all. There was literally nothing we could have done. More than a few students glanced up. Uraraka was still in surgery in the floor above them, in critical condition. Screw this. Siro got up and headed for the door. I'm gonna go outside and follow the cops until they find Izuku. Kaminari grabbed his arm. Dude, are you crazy? They'll call you a vigilante and maybe arrest you. I don't care. Siro angrily shook him off. Our friend is out there and we're sitting here, not doing anything. Siro's outburst caught many of them by surprise. He was good at rolling with the punches, but even he had a breaking point, and it seemed that he had reached it. We're going to be heroes, Siro went on. What kind of heroes sit back and let other people do the work for them? I'm in. Todoroki's face showed no emotion, but his voice was steady as he joined Siro by the door. I owe Izuku too much not to help. Ashido was right behind him, her smile only slightly forced. Shouldn't be too hard to follow the cops, right? Ida hesitated for only a moment, but sighed and joined them. I have to keep an eye on you all, if nothing else. Hell yeah. Hiroshima jumped up and punched one fist into his palm. What kind of man would I be if I stood back and did nothing? Yeyurazu tried to sit up, but winced and was soon forced back by Gyro. I, I would only slow you down. Stop. That night's surprises just kept on coming, because it was Asui who had shouted. She stood between ad hoc rescue team and the door, arms outstretched. Tears ran down her face, and her breath came in gasps, but she stood her ground. I can't I can't let you go, she said. Sue, Midori is your friend too, Ashido protested. Of course he is. More tears poured out, and Asui's tone became pleading. 
but we don't know where he is. We're not in any shape to help him, and we're not heroes yet. We're students. If you do this, even if you don't get arrested, you'll get expelled. You'll never become heroes, and Izuku would never forgive himself if you gave up your dreams to save him. Many of the students, even those who hadn't decided to go with Siro's plan, looked away uncomfortably. But Siro, Todoroki and Ashido remained firm. We're not stopping, Todoroki said. Don't make me do this, Asui begged. Ashido looked at her apprehensively. Do what? Asui pulled out her phone, her thumb hovering over the call button. I'll call Aizawa sensei and tell him what you're doing. You'll get stopped before you make it out the door. You wouldn't, Siro half pleaded, but even he was started to look defeated. I would. That was enough to take the wind out of their sails. It was one thing to do something with good intentions and face consequences. It was another to be punished before they could even get a chance to try. Todoroki sat back down on his bed and blankly stared at the floor. Ashido wiped away her tears and sat down next to him, head resting on his shoulder. Siro tried to glare at Asui but couldn't manage it, so he shuffled over to a wall and slid down to the floor. Asui fled to the furthest corner and curled up in a ball. Everyone tried to ignore her sniffling. With the excitement over, everyone else sank into melancholic silence. Everyone, that is, except Yeyorazu. An idea was poking through the painkillers clouding her mind, something Asui had done slowly combining with a memory. When it finally crystallized, she snapped to a sitting position, ignoring Gyro's cry of protest. That's it. She scrambled to grab her bag of personal effects, snatched her own phone, and frantically made a call. Aizawa-sensei, I need to talk to you. Ashido gave her a funny look. F. Momo, show's over, you don't have to call Aizawa-sensei. Yeyorazu waved her off, her attention focused on the phone. I think I know how to find Izuku. I just need his phone. Can you get it from the police? Less than five minutes later, Aizawa strode into the room, an evidence bag in one hand. He spared a glance at Asui, still in her self-imposed isolation, but kept walking to Yeyorazu. What is this about? Aizawa asked, and was taken aback when the girl ripped the bag out of his hand. Before he could stop her, she had torn the bag open and fiddled with the phone. Yeyorazu frowned and tapped at the screen for a long moment. Aha, uh -huh. I should have known his unlock code was All Might's birthday. She then scrolled through Midoriya's contacts list until she found what she was looking for. Everyone held their breath as Yeyorazu held the phone to her ear. Those who were closest were able to hear both sides of the conversation. Hey, Izuku. The female English-speaking voice sounded friendly enough. It's been a while, what's up? I'm sorry, this isn't Izuku, Yeyorazu said in English. I'm a friend of his, my name is Yeyorazu Momo. Oh, well, uh, we're busy right now, so we can't talk, bye. No, wait. Yeyorazu nearly dropped the phone in her frantic attempt to maintain the call. We need your help. With what? Izuku was kidnapped. There was a pause for several seconds. We'll be there in five minutes. Don't hang up. Now everyone, even those who knew Midoriya's secrets, were confused. Aizawa gripped his capture tool. The only sign of anxiety is he and everyone else looked towards the door. I hope you know what you're doing, Yeyorazu, he said. Yeyorazu bit her lip. So do I. Five minutes later, a green portal appeared from the other side of the room, which made everyone jump. Four people stepped out, the rising stars had never met them, but Midoriya had described them with enough detail for them to make a good guess that they were Ben Tennyson, Supergirl, Ultiman, and Ultra Girl. Even those who weren't in the know could identify a hero in costume, and none of them missed how two of them had watches almost identical to Midoriya's. All right, Ben Tennyson said, hands on his hips, where's my cousin? Midoriya blinked as light suddenly filled his vision, and then bit back a scream of pain when he landed on his broken arm. He struggled to his feet, only to find a blonde girl with sharpened incisors well within his personal space. Hi there, I'm Toga Himiko. Look at all that blood. I was right, you're a cutie. A knife slid out of Toga's sleeve, and she lunged, but Magni pulled her back with her quirk. Oh, come on. I was only gonna cut him up a little. Before Midoriya could reach for the ultimatrix, twice grabbed his broken arm and pulled it away. This time, he couldn't hold back a cry of agony. Sorry about that, twice said. I'm not really, but it's the thought that counts. Midoriya struggled for a moment, but his only hope of escape vanished when Spinner took a towel and tightly wrapped it around the ultimatrix, followed by a layer of duct tape so that Midoriya couldn't activate it. We're not taking any chances, the lizard man said gruffly, especially not with someone Stain thought was worthy. That's enough. Shigaraki's voice sent a chill down Midoriya's spine. Sit him up. Twice and Spinner dragged Midoriya over to a chair and roughly plopped him down. When the pain subsided to a terrible ache, Midoriya was finally able to take stock of his surroundings. While he had never been in a bar before, he'd seen enough movies to recognize one. 
All around him, the League of Villains sat at tables, bandaged injuries, or stood nearby in case he tried anything. Toga was still being held back by Magni. Even though nearly ten feet separated her from Midoriya, she kept stabbing in his direction. The only ones who seemed completely relaxed were Shigaraki and Kirajiri. The latter was cleaning a glass behind the counter, and the former sat across from Midoriya. Shigaraki now wore a black jacket over his usual outfit, though the many severed hands remained the same. You know, a few months back, I thought that the only hero I ever wanted to kill was All Might, Shigaraki said, idly tapping one finger against the countertop. All the others were trash, not worth my time. Then I met you, you showed me that anyone, even nervous little twerps like you, could be a threat. Now, I look at every hero and ask myself how could they stop me, even if their quirks are useless. I really should thank you, you made me think about how I need to move forward. With one eye swollen shut, Midoriya couldn't glare like he wanted. Glad I could help. Sarcasm is unbecoming, Kirajiri said mildly. I'll care when my bones aren't broken. Looks like pain makes you a smartass. Shigaraki nudged Midoriya's right hand with his foot. That simple motion caused another spike of agony. If it bothers you so much, why don't I just disintegrate that arm? You'll do no such thing. The voice that echoed from the television in the corner made everyone freeze. Remember what I told you, Tamura, I want him brought to me with as little damage as possible. Shigaraki bowed his head in the direction of the screen. Of course, master, I just wanted to get all that off my chest. That's fine, it's only proper that you thank those who help you grow. There was a brief chuckle that did nothing to comfort Midoriya. Hirajiri, please bring him to me. As you wish, master. Hirajiri created a portal next to Midoriya. Please go through. Midoriya nervously glanced around. And if I refuse? Shigaraki snorted. Then we leave you in a room with Toga. Considering the girl was waving a bloody knife in his direction, Midoriya decided to take his chances with the swirling portal. If you come back, let's talk. Toga winked at him. I'd love to get to know you better. No thanks, Midoriya thought. Okay, I need to somehow get this stuff off my arm so that I can use the Ultimatrix. Then I need to escape and turn into swamp fire soon, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to pass out if I don't. Shigaraki escorted Midoriya through the portal, four fingers on one hand clamped tightly around the back of his neck. It would only take a moment's contact with that fifth finger, and his spine would crumble to dust. I could really use Ben right now, if only to tell me things are going to be okay. Thinking of Ben nearly brought him to tears that had nothing to do with his injuries. He's gone. I don't know why, but reactivating the ultimates destroyed him. I'm alone here. When Midoriya stepped through the portal, he had to shield his good eye from the blinding lights around him. The bar had been dimly lit, so the sudden change threw him off. When his vision returned to normal, he found himself in what looked like a laboratory. Other than himself and Shigaraki, there was only one occupant but he seemed to fill the entire room with his presence. That was unusual, because he looked like he belonged in a hospital. Tubes slid under his fine suit to pump various chemicals into his body, and he was propped up in a wheelchair. He had a chiseled jaw and charming smile, but everything above his lips was a mass of scar tissue that even sealed his eyes shut. Despite his apparent infirmity, the man practically radiated power and confidence. Midoriya instinctively knew that this man could kill him in a heartbeat. Thank you, Tamura, you may leave us. Are you sure, master? For the first time, Shigaraki looked concerned. He might try something. Don't worry, I'm sure an old man like me can handle a broken boy. Shigaraki hesitated, then bowed. Call when you need him removed. I will. The man waited until Shigaraki retreated through the portal. I must also thank you for the growth you've spurred in my air. All Might was the goal, but he never prompted anything more than blind hatred. Midoriya didn't respond. Fear had locked his knees, and it was all he could do even blink. As if sensing this, the man leaned back in his wheelchair. He seemed to be consciously holding back his own aura, and Midoriya let out a breath he hadn't known he'd been holding. Now then, Midoriya Izuku. The man laced his fingers together. We have a great deal to talk about. Shall we start with Azmuth? A dozen heroes escorted them to a hastily emptied room in the hospital, followed by twice as many police officers. The Tennysons didn't take offense, though Ben and Ken seemed mildly amused, and Jen just tapped her foot impatiently as Eraserhead tried to grill them for information. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't getting anywhere. So, you're the Tennyson that Midoriya mentioned. Ben looked down at the name tag that the police had hastily provided. That's what it says here, yeah. The racer head's eyes narrowed. I should have you deported back to America. There's no way you're here legally. That's true, Ben admitted, and leaned forward, resting his elbows on the table that separated them. But ask yourself this, do you really have time to do that, when you could bend the rules long enough for us to help rescue a kidnapped kid? Eraserhead didn't even blink. Can you help? Actually, yes. I'd like to try the easy way first, if you don't mind. 
Ben waited until Eraser had nodded at the police and other heroes and then turned to his family. Kara, Ken, could you pop outside for a quick sec? The room briefly shuddered as Ultiman and Supergirl left in a blur. They were only gone for a few moments, and then they were back. The heroes could barely even comprehend how fast they'd moved. Not even Hawks or All Might moved that fast. We searched the whole country, Supergirl announced, to the shock of every non-Tennyson in the room. Either he's been moved across the ocean, or he's being held somewhere lined with lead. The bad guys might have been prepared for someone with X-ray vision. We couldn't hear him either, Ultiman added. Again, either he's not in Japan, or he's in a soundproofed room. No one voiced the possibility that the reason they couldn't see or hear Midoriya was because he was dead. Until they found a body that was off the table. Speed, X-ray vision, super hearing, Aizawa noted. Multiple quirks, all extremely powerful. Just who did Midoriya become family with? Okay, easy way is a bust. Ben sighed and took out his phone. Let's try the other easy way. Ultra Girl glanced at what her father was doing. Wait, you have it as an app. What, did you think I'd keep the tracker on my laptop? Eraserhead frowned. You put a tracker on him? What? No, of course not. I put a tracker on his watch. Totally different. Ben glanced up and saw the incredulous looks he was getting. Considering what the kid wants to do with his life, I thought it would be a good idea. The racer head wasn't one for hope or prayer, but he was starting to think there might be some divine providence at work. If this rather odd family helped get his student back sooner. He felt that hope die when Ben's phone made a distinctly unhopeful sound. Well crap. Ben sighed. Okay, we've got good news and bad news. The good news is that he's definitely still alive. How can you tell? The racer had asked. Ben waved his phone a little. If he wasn't, the watch would have immediately shut down. But I'm getting a signal. That's where the bad news comes in. Looks like the thing is damaged, and I can't get a lock on its location. More bad news, it has a catastrophic error. Supergirl's eyes widened. Ben, does that mean what I think it does? I hope not, or worst case scenario. Ben looked Aizawa dead in the eye and mimed an explosion with his hands. Boom. I D don't know what your tea talking about. All for one just smiled. Come now, lying isn't a good way to start a relationship. I want us to be friends, Midoriya Sam. It's hard tea to be be friends when I D don't even know why your name. I have to give the boy credit, he's at least trying to maintain eye contact. I applaud his courage, though his stutter makes it less impressive. You may call me all for one. When Midoriya's eyes, or rather, the only eye that still opened, went wide, all for one chuckled. I see that you've heard of me. Did All Might tell you about me? And no, a villain from my island mentioned you. Midoriya shifted and winced when he strained his injuries. All for one almost frowned. He had let Shigaraki run most of the show, but he had left explicit instructions to leave the boy as undamaged as possible. What did this person say? He, he said that you were the criminal underworld's boogeyman, and that everyone worked for you in some way, even if they didn't know it. All for one grinned. A bit of an exaggeration. While I am the master of Japan's underworld, my reach is far less secure overseas. Th that's still impressive. All for one didn't miss the way Midoriya's gaze flitted around the room and silently approved. He's trying to keep me talking, while also using mild flattery in an effort to distract me, while he searches for a way out. Not bad, though useless in this case. Why don't you follow me? The man turned his wheelchair around. I have something to show you, to prove that I know what I'm talking about. And if I say no, Midori aside, but then winced again when the deep breath shifted his broken ribs. I'm guessing I won't like what happens. You catch on quick. The trip through all for one sanctum was short, but unbearably quiet for the teenager, who broke the silence after only a minute. Why did you think that All Might talked about you? All that. All Might and I are old rivals, you see, of all those in his line. Only he became powerful enough to do this. All for one tapped the arm of his wheelchair. All of his predecessors tried, but none came close. Predecessors. All for one resisted the urge to laugh. He usually respected All Might enough to keep the man's secret. But he saw a chance to ruin his image in the eyes of an impressionable would-be hero. What do you know of All Might's quirk? Midoriya blinked. Um, not much. He has super strength, speed, durability, and reflexes, but he's never shared exactly how it works. Most people assume it's some kind of enhancement quirk. Oh, the effect it has on him would make you think so, but that isn't the truth. You see, All Might's quirk isn't his. What? His quirk is special, in that it can be passed on to another, not like a genetic lineage, but actually given from one person to someone completely different. It grows stronger in the body of each user, making the next person to use it even more powerful, enhancing their quirks and their bodies far beyond what they would normally be capable of. All for one smiled at the fascination on Midoriya's face. The quirk's name is one for all. 
the original user hoped that it would become the opposite of my power and thus defeat me. Why? Why should I believe anything you say? You don't have to, if anything, I'd be disappointed if you trusted my word right off the bat. However, as I said, I don't want our relationship to start with lies. All for one roll to a stop in front of a sealed door. But enough about the issues between All Might and I let's talk about what connects us. Once the code to the door was punched in, All for One led the boy into his lab and waited for his reaction. He watched his Midoriya scan the room, eyeing every computer and box of tools, until he saw the device, the device that bore the same symbol as that on his arm. After living as long as I have, it's important that you keep your mind busy. I spent almost a decade doing nothing but study the stars. I even used some of my ill-gotten wealth to fund efforts to renew our space programs, though that failed. All for one side wistfully, then continued. However, I found something more intriguing much closer to home. This satellite was orbiting the planet, but it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It took a great deal of effort, but I managed to bribe the crew of one of our last manned space flights and have this satellite retrieved for me. I spent decades studying it. At first, it was just a passing interest, but then I managed to open it up. Do you know what I found? All for one didn't wait for an answer. He had kept this project to himself for so long, and it was exciting to finally share it with someone. I found records, records of genetic manipulation on a planetary scale. This machine used technology far beyond anything I've ever seen to change our species. It didn't take me long to realize what that meant, that quirks are not some natural evolution, as most scientists would have us believe. No, this was done artificially. I tried to crack the firewalls around the computer, but I still haven't gotten far. All I've really learned is the name of the one who built this, who did this to us, Asmuth. Midoriya was silent for a long moment, but he didn't have to say anything. All for one could see on his face that he wasn't as shocked as anyone else might have been. That alone confirmed his suspicions about the boy. I don't believe that Asmuth is his real name, he went on. It's likely a code name. I have no proof as to why he would do this to the human race, but I have a theory. He was, or is, because I suspect that someone like him would be intelligent enough to find a way to transcend mortality. An incredibly intelligent man. One who saw that humanity could be so much more than it is. He launched this satellite and used it to somehow modify our DNA, not all of us, though. 20% of the population is quirkless, I believe that he used them as a control group, or as exemptions, in case his experiment killed everyone it touched, and he needed to start over. How close am I to the truth? Midoriya tore his eyes away from the satellite. How would I know? All for one shook his head. Dear boy, the proof is there on your wrist. That watch couldn't have been made by anyone else. He chose you, just like he chose me. While Midoriya had been lying before, now he was visibly confused. Chose you? What? Why else would he grant you powers to rival mine? My quirk is too powerful for him to control. Perhaps he saw how All Might and his predecessors failed, so he created a champion of his own. He has given you a quirk to match the versatility of mine. All for one could see some wariness in the boy's eyes, but still mostly confusion. I took the name for my quirk as my own name. I can steal the quirks of others, keep them for as long as I want, combine them, or even give them to entirely different people. I believe Asma selected that power for someone as a champion, but he expected that person to treat this quirk as a great responsibility. He must have done the same for you. So, tell me all for one face Midoriya directly. Where is Asmuth? What is he planning? And Midoriya nearly buckled under the aura of malice that All for One had perfected over his long life. I don't know. Pity. All for One sighed, and then pressed a button on his wheelchair. A warp gate, courtesy of Kirajiri, appeared next to him. We'll continue this conversation when you're feeling more cooperative. Until then, enjoy your stay with the League of Villains. Midoriya opened his mouth, but a hand reached out from the portal and pulled him through. The warp gate closed immediately, leaving all for one alone with his project. I have him now, he said quietly. The next move is yours, Asmuth. No one was quite sure how it came about, but Class 1A had worked out a schedule to determine who was taking watch in their shared hospital room. Keeping watch wasn't strictly necessary, what with a dozen heroes and 50 police officers guarding the building. But after what had happened at the camp, no one was willing to take any chances. It was during Ishido's shift that the doors swung open, and Ultiman walked in. Hey, everyone, what's good? Ultiman's smile wasn't like All Might's, it was the kind of smile one gave to a friend as they were about to tell a joke. Ashido decided straight away that she liked him. Hey, not much, she answered for everyone just recovering from a near-death experience. So, a typical Tuesday, then. A few of the students chuckled, and Ultiman sat down on an empty bed. You guys are Izuku's classmates, right? 
who here is still hurt. Over half the students raised their hands, even Bakugo, though only after Kirishima nudged him hard enough to make him wince. Ultiman nodded and snapped his fingers. There was a flash of green light, and when it faded, the students who had still been recovering from Mustard's poison sat up, looking as if nothing had happened. Gayurazu frowned and peeled off the bandages on her shoulder to find only unblemished skin. Even the stitches were gone. Ashido blinked twice. Her brain, still sluggish after everything that had happened, needed a moment to remember that Ultiman had been the one to save Ingenium. If he could do that, then maybe. Excuse me. She bowed when Ultiman turned to her. I know you just did a lot for my friends, but can you help one more? Absolutely. The complete lack of hesitation gave Ashido a bit of hope. Who's hurt? Her name's Uraraka Achako. Ashido realized that Ultiman probably had no idea what Uraraka looked like, so she pulled out her phone and brought up a picture. Here she is. Ultiman smiled at the image. It was of Uraraka sitting close to Midoriya, with Iri between them. Okay, that's adorable. He stepped back and looked around, as if searching for something. The sharp-eyed among the class noticed that his eyes were glowing. There she is. I'll do what I can. As Ultiman turned to leave, Bakugo stepped forward. Hey, what is Deku to you people? Why do you care so much? Ultiman raised an eyebrow at the nickname, but didn't address it. He's family, even if he wasn't. Shouldn't heroes do everything they can to help people in need? With his peace said, Ultiman vanished in a blur. Before she really knew what she was doing, Ashido followed after him, as did Siro and Todoroki. Even if they had accepted that they couldn't try to rescue Midoriya themselves, Ultiman might know something. Besides, he was going to try to help Uraraka. It would do them all some good to see another of their friends recovered. Unfortunately, they were stopped outside Uraraka's room by a police officer. Ultiman was nowhere to be found, but through the small window in the door. Ashido could see the man in Uraraka's room. Either he had convinced the officer to let him in, or had entered without being seen. Somehow, Ashido suspected the latter. Ultiman surprised them all when he walked through the door, not by opening it, but by literally walking through it, much like Tagata would. Hey. Ultiman grabbed the shocked officer by the arm. You. Do you know where her arm is? No, wait, wrong person to ask. I need a doctor or someone who was at the scene. Adding to the surprise and confusion, Ultiman glowed, and then a perfect copy stepped out of himself, which he addressed. You, stay here and keep an eye on things. I'll be right back. The copy saluted. Got it, boss. He waved as Ultiman phased through the floor, and then smiled at everyone else. He'll be back in a minute. So, anyone see any good movies lately? Mezu was thankful that Aizawa had contacted him as quickly as he did. He was able to smooth over some ruffled feathers, help organize the search for Midoriya, and personally check on his students, all at the same time. He managed to convince the police to let the Tennyson family help, on the condition that they would receive none of the credit, and they would leave Japan as soon as Midoriya was rescued. Thinking of Midoriya made his heart clench, while Nezu couldn't show favoritism, he genuinely liked the boy, and dearly wanted him to become a great hero. Instead of checking on his progress, he had to help organize his rescue, and took it upon himself to explain the situation to the boy's mother. Midori and Ko had sensed almost immediately that something was wrong when she was brought to the hospital. She had demanded to know if Izuku was hurt. Instead, she found out that her son had been kidnapped. There had been a moment of shock, which gave the heroes and police nearby time to brace themselves before Inko broke down in tears. There was only a few seconds of sobbing before Supergirl pushed her way through and picked up the other woman as easily as she would an infant. Is there a spare room I can take her? Supergirl asked quietly, rather than demand that she return to where other officers had been keeping an eye on her. A sympathetic hero guided her to somewhere more private. Two police officers and that same hero took up guard duty outside the room but Nezu followed Supergirl inside. He waited until the American had calmed Inko down with soft words and a strong embrace, and then bowed deeply. Midoriya-san, I cannot apologize enough for this tragedy, he said as formally as possible. I promise you that we are doing everything we can to find your son. That may sound like empty platitudes, but I swear that it is the truth. Inko sniffled. Th thank you, Nezu-san. But I don't think I'll feel better until I can see my baby with my own eyes. I've got some good news on that front, Supergirl said, obviously saying so in front of Inko to give her hope. Ultra Girl and I have scanned everywhere that isn't blocking our sight. We've eliminated most of Japan, but that still leaves about 200 locations. We'll try to narrow it down further. Inko grabbed Supergirl's hand. Thank you. Supergirl's smile was brittle. I know what it's like to have my son taken from me. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. She paused and tilted her head, as if listening for something. Nezu's own ears twitched in response, but even his keen hearing didn't detect anything unusual. 
Ken's causing a scene. He's yelling at that guy with the scarf. Nezu sighed. I'd better handle it. What do you mean? You didn't bring back her arm. Ken had been rather calm until now, but Eraserhead's words nearly had him decking the man. Aizawa might not have been aware of Ken's true power, but years of being a hero had honed his instincts to a razor's edge. He had a feeling that Ultiman had the power to completely destroy him, and very well might have, if not for Ben's hand on his son's shoulder to help rein in his temper. There was hardly anything left to recover, Eraserhead bit out. It was caught in a forest fire and burned to cinders. The only reason we even know it's hers is because no one else lost an arm. Eraserhead had seen far worse in his career, but the image of his student's charred limb was something that would haunt his nightmares for a long time. Ultiman took a deep breath and visibly calmed himself. Well, that sucks. If her arm had been saved, I might have been able to reattach it. She would have needed a lot of physical therapy, but she would recover. I can't regenerate a whole limb from nothing. He paused and then looked at his father. What about clockwork? I wish, but you know the rules. Then sighed, and he seemed to age ten years in an instant. No using time powers on living beings, or we'll start a time war. We got our one warning after Bonfire went and changed things. Eraserhead had no idea what they were talking about, but he suspected it went way beyond what he could reasonably deal with. All he knew all he cared about was that they were discussing options that could help your Araka. However, the mention of time powers gave him an idea. We have someone at UA she's only a child, but her powers might be able to help. I would advise against that, Nezu said as he joined the conversation. Eri-chan has had exactly one lesson on how to use her powers. She's nowhere near ready to use them on a human. Besides, her attachment to Uraraka-san could backfire if she were to see one of her guardians so injured. It could cause an emotional outburst, and that would make her powers go out of control. Which might kill Uraraka instead of help her, Aizawa finished glumly. The good news is that she's stable, Ultiman said. I cleaned up the burns, and the doctors are already transfusing blood. Whatever happens, she's not going to die. While I am truly thankful for that, I am afraid that her future as a hero is lost. Nezu sighed. Successful restoration from Eri Chan is possibly years away, and while a prosthetic arm will help, her quirk relies on her real hands. Modern technology can't replicate her powers. She'll probably have to wear a glove for the rest of her life, Aizawa added. Without her other hand to cancel her quirk's effect, she could permanently remove gravity around anything she touches. Ken, the older Tennyson tapped his chin in thought. Maybe you should call in a favor from a friend. Ultiman paused and looked at his father. Brainiac or Cyborg? Cyborg is still working on the fusion reactor problem. He can't leave. Ben gripped his son by the shoulder. Take care of the girl. We'll handle getting Izuku back. I assume you have an associate who can help in this situation. Nezu decided at that moment to take a leap of faith. If it helps, I can give you your Araka-san's quirk records. Have it ready when I get back. Ken held up one hand. Give me a bit. With a snap of his fingers and a flash of green light, he was gone. Nezu hoped that he would be back soon with good news. They all could use some especially with Uraraka's parents on their way. Midoriya wasn't sure what surprised him more that the League of Villains hadn't tried to beat him to a pulp as soon as he returned to the bar, or that Magni handed him some painkillers and water. The pills were even still in an unopened bottle to prove that they hadn't been tampered with. The boss boss wants you alive and in one piece, Magni explained as she then bandaged him up. And Kirajiri doesn't want you bleeding all over his floor. Th thanks. Midoriya was too bewildered by what was happening. You're welcome. Magni patted him on the head when she was done and left him alone in the storeroom they were using as a makeshift cell. Before Midoriya could even think about ripping off the rag separating him from the Ultimatrix, Spinner opened the door. Which is why you have to wait until the next guard comes in. The lizard man shouted, and then plopped down into the only other chair. God, she's so irresponsible. I'm confused, Midoriya blurted out before he could stop himself. We're not amateurs, Spinner said as he idly flipped a knife from one hand to the other. We know better than to take our eyes off you. No, I mean. Midoriya gestured to the bandages. Oh, that. Spinner grinned in a way that might have been meant to be encouraging, but his reptilian features made it intimidating. You were declared worthy by Stain. Even if you're our enemy, you're still a hero who should be fighting villains. Thanks. Midoriya didn't like the idea of someone like Stain approving of him, but it was keeping him alive, and that meant he had hope. Spinner just grunted and resumed tossing his knife. Just don't do anything to change my mind. Kirijiri will get mad if I get blood all over the bar. You're certainly improving your dramatic flair, Mr. Compress said as he entered the storeroom. Pardon me, Spinner, but I thought our young guest should know that the boy he tried so nobly to save was reunited with his family. Midoriya perked up. Really? Yes, and none the worse for wear. 
Compress still wore his mask, but there was fondness in his voice. I may be a villain, but I have a code, my young friend. At that point, Midoriya was extremely confused. The media had always portrayed villains as the worst kind of criminals, and his encounter with Muscular and Chimera had hardly done much to improve that image. However, Spinner and Compress had been polite, if not downright nice, even all for one had been charming, in a terrifying kind of way. Of course, there was also Slice and Toga, so the number of villains who fit the stereotype still outnumbered those who didn't. Anyway, how are your injuries? Compressed tone sounded sincere as he leaned on his cane. I'm afraid that we lack the facilities to properly treat you, and it's not like we can just let you go to a hospital. Midoriya shrugged, but that just made his broken bones protest. I'm in a lot of pain. Should have just surrendered, Spinner said idly. I doubt our former comrade Muscular would have allowed that, Compress replied. Good point. Spinner shrugged. Then again, a real hero would have fought back. If you hadn't, I'd have had to kill you. Midoriya leaned back and tried not to look as terrified as he felt. So much for being nicer villains. How am I going to get out of here? Besides trying to figure out an escape, Midoriya now had time to really think about everything All for One had said and shown him. He had Azmuth's satellite, the source of quirks on this earth. If his quirk really could take other powers, did that mean he could potentially access the DNA inside the machine? The idea terrified him. But he wasn't completely accurate, Midoriya realized. He thinks that Azmuth is actually a human. He hasn't made the connection that quirks come from alien DNA, and he thinks that Azmuth is somewhere on this planet. Can I use that somehow? Can I try to feed him false information? Would that even work? If he's been alive since before we stopped sending astronauts into space, then he's been around since quirks first appeared. Which means he's had a long time to read people. Midoriya sighed. No, I can't lie my way out of this. The best I can do is stall and either hope I'm rescued, or find an opportunity to use the Ultimatrix. Alert. The Ultimatrix chose that moment to speak. Catastrophic error detected. Repair sequence initiated. Repair sequence unresponsive. Catastrophic error detected. All functions suspended. Yeah, I think I'm going to need some help. Nezu was good at maintaining his composure, but even he was starting to reach his limit. He had just spoken to Uraraka's parents, and the distraught couple was in their daughter's hospital room. Achako had yet to wake up, and the only good thing she'd see when she did would be her parents ready to support her. Now, Nezu was on the phone with the few people who could push even his buttons, normally. He could let it slide, but the frustrating part was that he had no idea why Hawks was being so unhelpful. And the reason why you can't assist in the search for Midoriya-san is what? The sigh on the other end of the line caused a crackle that made Nezu's ear twitch. Then tied down with a bunch of stuff here. The chaos that attack caused triggered a bunch of small-time villains to crawl out of their holes and cause some trouble. I've gotta keep that situation contained. I would have imagined that you would be more concerned about the fate of your intern. Nezu hated to play a card like that, but it was as if Hawks didn't even care. Hey, I'm worried sick about the kid. Hawks protested. One of my psychics is in tears about it. Still, if I run myself ragged searching for him, I'm gonna be useless when I'm really needed. Believe me, if I see the League of Villains, I'll let everyone know, and then I'll save the kid myself. But until that happens, I've gotta do what I can hear. Nezu didn't want to admit that Hawks was right. Less experienced heroes would burn themselves out in a useless search when someone they cared about was in trouble. Most of the gathering task force, consisting of dozens of high-ranking heroes, were already frustrated that they had to sit and twiddle their thumbs, but they would be needed to rescue Midoriya once he was located, and hopefully put the league down at the same time. Very well, but keep us informed if you find anything. Of course. Goodbye, Nezu-san. At least Hawks had the decency to sound completely serious before he hung up. Hey, Mickey. Nezu blinked at Ultra Girl as she walked up to him. Any luck on getting more backup? I've gathered everyone we could on such a short notice. Nezu tilted his head. I'm sorry, Mickey. You look like Mickey Mouse. Ultra Girl shrugged, and then held her hand up to one ear. Someone just got out of a car. Five people, and I'm hearing Izuku getting mentioned. I thought you said we weren't getting anyone else. Nezu took a moment to be impressed by her super hearing, then mentally ran through the list of heroes he'd contacted. He was only expecting two more, not five. I'd called everyone I could, but it seems that someone brought in more. He hopped onto her shoulder, and was surprised at how solid she was, it was like sitting on solid steel. Shall we go see who it is? Fine, but if you expect another free ride, I'm feeding you to my cat. Nezu took a brief sniff. 
I don't believe you have a cat. I'll get one just so I can feed you to it. Nezu tried not to laugh at the banter as Ultra Girl took him downstairs. Waiting in the hospital lobby was Gran Torino and Sir Night Eye, as he'd expected, but not the big three. As soon as Nejire Chan saw him, she practically sprinted over. How is everyone? I heard Achako got hurt. Where's Izuku? Did they find him yet? Ultra Girl grabbed the other girl by the shoulders, picked her up like she weighed nothing at all, and planted her further away. Please step back. You are very much in my personal space. I'm afraid that we're still searching for Midoriya-san, Nezu said calmly. You'll have to be patient on that front. As for Yuraraka-san, she is stable, though we don't yet know if she will fully recover. Gran Torino and Night Eye's only display of distress was a slight tightening around the eyes. The big three, on the other hand, ran through a full spectrum of visible stress. Nejire Chan's eyes were full of tears, and she hugged Sun Eater while Lemillion gritted his teeth and cracked his knuckles. I assume you brought them here on your authority, Nezu asked Night Eye. The former psychic pushed his glasses further up on his nose. Yes, I'm aware that I only have that authority for Lemillion, but say no more, I'll handle the paperwork. Nezu smiled kindly at the students. If you want something to do, I can temporarily assign you to the hospital's security. You can check in with everyone. Ultra Girl plucked the principal off her shoulder and handed him to Night Eye. I'll show them where the kids are. Night Eye placed Nezu on the floor, but looked at Ultra Girl suspiciously as she led the big three away. Who is that girl? She's not Japanese, and I don't recognize her from any foreign hero agencies. She's Midoriya-san's cousin one of them, anyway. Nezu straightened his tie as he figured out what he could and couldn't say. She and her family have the means to help us find Midoriya-san. In fact, they've eliminated a large number of potential hiding spots the League might be using. Impressive, Gran Torino admitted. It's only been six hours. It's been six hours since they got here, but twelve since the boy was kidnapped. Night Eye's frown somehow deepened. If we look at the average, we have only 12 hours left before our chances of recovering the boy drop to unacceptable levels. Then I would like your help in the command center we've set up, Nezu said. You can help us narrow down the search. He paused. When will all might be joining us? Night I made sure no one was listening before answering quietly. He's conserving his energy. He is convinced that all for one will be directly involved and wants to be at his best for that confrontation. He will join us once we're sure of the boy's location. Just so long as he isn't wasting his time limit on his own personal search, Nezu said grimly. We're going to need every advantage we can get. Now, we have an hour to collaborate before I have to go. Gran Torino raised an eyebrow. Where are you going? For once, Nezu let his good cheer completely slip for a moment. I have to talk to the press. So, you're Izuku's cousin. Lamillion leaned in close so that he could whisper. Don't worry, he told us the real story. Ultra Girl sighed and started counting on her fingers. Okay, there's his seven classmates. You three, the rodent did he tell anyone else? His mom, I think. For the love of the point of keeping world shaking secrets is not telling anyone. Ultra Girl sighed again. It's the thing with bonfire all over again. Who? My girlfriend. Ultra Girl smiled fondly. She tried to change history without telling us what she was trying to prevent. It didn't work, and she ended up blabbing the whole story after about three days. Sun Eater blinked several times. You have a lot of weird things happening on your earth, says the guy who turns into a sushi bar. Ultra Girl smirked. Izuku told us about you three when he visited. Lemillion raised an eyebrow. You mean after you kidnapped him? We only borrowed him without permission, and it was for a good cause. Ultra Girl's words were spoken with such haughtiness that it made even Sun Eater let out a muffled laugh. The smile on Ultra Girl's face suddenly faded. Oh, crap. The big three tensed. What is it? Lemillion asked. Ultra Girl winced. That Uraraka girl just woke up. Achako was quiet for a long, tense moment as she stared at where her right arm used to be. Yesterday, there had been a perfectly functional limb, and now, nothing. Not even a shoulder for the sleeve of her hospital gown to rest on. Her mother, Yukiko, tentatively reached out for her daughter, Achako. A cross between a sob and a hiccup tore its way out of Achako's throat, and tears started to fall. What I can't why ala Yukiko cried along with her as she held her daughter close. Achako's father, Tenma, looked back at them worriedly before turning back to the doctor. Please, if there's anything that you can do, tell me. The doctor sighed. I'll be honest with you, you're Araka san there's not much we can do. A prosthetic can give her a normal life, but there's no way we can replicate her quirk. From how I understand how her powers work, she will have to keep her hand covered from now on. Ken's duplicate, who had been staying quiet in the corner until now, coughed into his hand to get their attention. I hate to argue with a medical professional, but I think you'll be getting a second opinion right about now. A green portal opened up, and the real Ultiman stepped through, followed by a rather strange-looking man. 
He was tall, with silver skin on his hands and face. The rest of his body was covered in black segmented armor. His hair didn't look quite normal, and if you were to look closely, it would be because his hair was actually a mass of thin black wires. On his chest were three glowing circles, arranged in a flat triangle, with two lines connecting the outer circles to the center. Ultiman took one look at the tear-stained Uraraka's and winced. I'm guessing she just woke up. Rather than answer, the duplicate merged with his creator, and Ultiman shuddered as he suddenly received two sets of memories. I hate doing that, he muttered, and then smiled kindly at the shocked family. Sorry about that. You can call me Ultiman, and this is my friend, Brainiac. He's going to help you with your, uh, arm problem. Brainiac gave him a dry look. There had to be a better way to say that. Shut up, it's been a long day. The doctor frowned. Now, hold on, I can't let you just walk in here and... Ultiman snapped his fingers, and a green band appeared over the doctor's mouth. Sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to shush your face. Brainy, do your thing. Brainiac calmly approached Achako's bed. May I? I promise that I will not cause any harm. When the Uraraka's were too stunned to reply, Brainiac removed one of the discs on his chest and flicked it at Achako. It hovered in midair and then rotated to face the girl. A beam of light swept over her several times. Ultiman noticed a file with Achako's name in the doctor's hand and snatched it up. He read through it in the blink of an eye and then handed it to his friend. Take a look, I think it'll help. Brainiac looked through the file and then nodded. It will. I understand how her powers work and I will build a replacement to perform the same tasks. Tenma's jaw dropped. Wait are you saying you could make an arm that could duplicate her quirk? Yes, that is what I said. Brainiac glanced back at Ultiman. Do people here have auditory deficiencies? And you wonder why Mary broke up with you for a year? Ultiman muttered. Brainiac ignored him. I will have the basic prosthetic functions complete in one hour. Replicating your gravitic manipulation will take approximately three more hours. Is this acceptable? Achako burst into tears again, too overwhelmed to do anything other than nod shakily. Her mother, on the other hand, looked concerned. I appreciate your offer, but something like that. I don't think we can afford it. Ultiman frowned. Did I say anything about charging you for this? He turned to Brainiac. We're not charging them for this, right? Of course not. Despite not showing any emotion, Brainiac drew himself up with as much dignity as a machine could. This is simply the right thing to do. Yukiko and Tenma were now almost as overwhelmed as their daughter. These people, these complete strangers, had just offered their daughter a chance to keep her dream out of the goodness of their hearts. Th thank you, Tenma said, and bowed low. Okay, you can thank us by not doing that, Ultiman said awkwardly. Seriously, we're American, that's weird. I require a portal back to my lab, Brainiac said, his disc returned to his chest, and he nodded. I have all the data I need. Ultiman created a portal, and wiped his hands after Brainiac was gone. Okay, we just need to get Izuku back, and we'll have the full set fixed. Achako sniffed. Izuku. W what happened T to Izuku? Oh right. Ultiman winced. You've missed a lot. Midoriya nearly passed out from the pain several times, even with the pills the League had provided. For all their strange hospitality, none of the villains had done more than basic first aid. The villains actually allowed to be near Midoriya? Anyway. His guards had changed shifts several times, usually depending on how bored they got keeping watch. Toga's shift had lasted about 30 seconds, because she had tried to cut off his ear as soon as she entered the storeroom. It had taken the combined efforts of Twice and Spinner to drag her out, and she nearly stabbed them both in the process. Come on, I just want to make him cuter. Toga complained. You guys cleaned up all that yummy blood, and I want to see more. Those guys have good reflexes, Shigaraki said as he sat in front of Midoriya. I was hoping she'd cut you up a little before they stopped her. Midoriya's heart was hammering in his chest, which turned the slow throb from his broken ribs into a rapid fire parade of pain. Why you really hate me that much? Well, you beat my Namu at the USJ, almost fried me, and you beat Stain. I'd be lying if I said you didn't deserve some payback. Shigaraki chuckled. Then again, seeing you beaten to a pulp like this is pretty satisfying. Darkness was beginning to creep into the edges of Midoriya's vision. The pain was nearly too much to bear at that point, and he was close to passing out. He had only one card left to play that might keep him alive. He would have to hope all for one didn't see through his attempted deception. I see can't do th this anymore. He gasped out, not needing to feign the agony he was in. Jay just t tell why your boss I want to t talk. 
Shigaraki smiled. Sure thing. Just let me show you something before you go. It's one of these two places, Supergirl said confidently to the group of heroes. They're both off the beaten path, both stuffed to the gills with anti-surveillance stuff, and they're both running on their own sources of power. They are also relatively close to each other, geographically speaking. Within Kamino Ward, Night I added. If one location is a dead end, the team sent to raid it can quickly reinforce the other. We're running out of time, All Might said, and addressed everyone in the room, including the three students who technically weren't supposed to be there. Heroes move out. Midori a bit back a scream as Shigaraki hauled him to his feet and dragged him into the bar. Twice sat him down and kept his hands on his shoulders as Kurajiri turned on the news. Midoriya recognized Nezu and Vlad King immediately, though it took him a second to realize that the man in a suit and mostly combed hair was Aizawa. I want to reassure everyone that Yue is utilizing every available resource to assist law enforcement in rescuing Midoriya Izuku, Aizawa said. No matter what happens, we will bring him home. Excuse me. A reporter stood up. I have a question. Make it fast, Aizawa said sharply. While we all hope that Midoriya san is rescued, I've heard rumors that at least one of your students is in the hospital with critical injuries. Can you confirm? One of our students was brought in for surgery, Aizawa said gravely, but the danger has passed. Midoriya felt his heart drop into his stomach at the confirmation. When it came to hero-related injuries, critical often meant that their career was over. Who had been hurt? One of his classmates. His friends. Oh god, he thought with mounting horror, I left Ochako with just ragdoll against Slice. What happened to her? Another reporter, this one with a sneer that seemed carved into his face, stood up. Can you explain why the League of Villains has kidnapped this boy? What reason do they have for taking a hostage? You obviously haven't seen many crimes, Aizawa said. He's a minor, he's known to the public because of the sports festival, and he wants a career in stopping people like them. Really? Somehow, the reporter's sneer grew even larger. My sources tell me that these criminals think that your precious student might be open to joining them. Midoriya's jaw dropped. Becoming a villain was so far off base that he had never even entertained the possibility. He wasn't the only incredulous one, most of the other reporters scoffed or rolled their eyes. Aizawa stood and gave the man the hardest glare Midoriya had ever seen. You're a reporter from a magazine well known for publishing outlandish theories that have no basis in fact. Your sources are online conspiracy theorists that are too cowardly to use their real names. Let me tell you the truth, in no uncertain terms, Midoriya Izuku is one of the most promising students of his generation. This is not because of his quirk, but because of the kind of person he is. He genuinely wants to help others. The only reason he wants to be the best is because it will allow him to help as many people as possible. Heroes like that are rare, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that Midoriya succeeds. Despite his pain and worry, Midoriya felt a wave of affection for his teacher. If he made it out of this alive, he swore to live up to Aizawa's confidence in him. The reporter's sneer never wavered. Pretty words, but you still need to rescue the boy, and that's assuming you find him. Here's another truth. Aizawa leaned forward just a little, but he seemed to loom over the reporter. We will get him back. Shigaraki lazily waved his hand, and Kurajiri turned off the TV. He's confident, but that reporter is right. We're so far off the grid that the only way to find this place is by accident. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. The coincidence was so great that no one could do anything but stare. Hello? A muffled voice called from outside. Pizza delivery. I didn't order anything, twice muttered. But I'll take it. Someone get rid of them. Shigaraki ordered, and placed four fingers of one hand against Midoriya's neck. Just in case, Spinner held a short sword behind his back as he cautiously approached the door. Just as his hand touched the knob, smash, the door exploded inward, along with a good chunk of the wall. The shockwave bowled over most of the villains, and those that weren't soon joined their comrades thanks to several blurs that collided with them. I suggest you surrender, villains, All Might said, fists on his hips as other heroes charged around him. Oh, crap, it's All Might. Even with the bandages around his body, Chimera drew himself up and readied for a fight. Fight our way out. Bad dog. Midoriya's eyes went wide as Supergirl of all people flew in and punched Chimera in the face with enough force to knock him out. Sit. Stay. A man who looked like his skin was made of wood swung through the hole in the wall on a branch of his own making. Kamui Woods, an up-and-coming hero who had already made a name for himself, aimed his free hand at the villains. Lacquered chain prison. Thick tendrils of wood sprouted from his arm, wrapping around most of the villains, even those who were unconscious. Dabai's hands erupted with blue flame, but before he could do more than singe his bonds, the fire was put out by a torrent of water. Pretty sure the sign says no smoking. Ultra Girl quipped as she shook a few droplets from her hand. Before Dabai could reply, 
Gran Torino flew in on the jets of air that shot from his feet and smashed him on the head. The villain slumped in Kamui Wood's grip. Even if he was still conscious, his bell was rung hard enough to remove him as a threat for the time being. Midoriya could hardly believe what was happening forget that All Might himself had come to save him. How are people from an entirely different universe here? Hey, cousin. Midoriya stared as yet another familiar face appeared next to All Might Ben Tennyson, who had turned into Diamond Head, smiled confidently at him. Don't worry, we'll get you out of here. You really think that? Shigaraki had been the only villain not captured or knocked out by virtue of having a hostage. You really think I'm just going to give up after everything I've been through? That's the sane and rational thing to do, yes, Ultra Girl said. After what this world has done to me, sane and rational doesn't fit in the picture. Shigaraki's grip on Midoriya tightened, and the heroes tensed when they saw his pinky finger inch closer and closer to the boy's neck. This was the worst possible scenario a villain with the power to kill with a touch, in control of a hostage. You realize there's no way for you to escape. Shigaraki Tamura, All Might boomed, his grin never leaving his face. If you surrender peacefully, perhaps we can work something out with the authorities. At that point, Shigaraki was nearly hyperventilating, and he stared at All Might with wide eyes. You, you don't get to tell me what to do, All Might. I'm this way because of you. I hate you, Kurajiri. He turned to his lieutenant. Bring in the Nomis, all of them, before Kirajiri could reply. Supergirl moved with blinding speed and punched him in the armored collar. He gasped, and then went as limp as a vapor-based being could. Shigaraki made a noise of protest, and in that moment of distraction, Midoriya made his move. He jumped as far as his broken body would allow, towards the arms of All Might as he ran to catch the student. Shigaraki's reflexes, however, were honed as well as any pro hero, and he moved at the same time. His fingers gripped Midoriya's left arm, specifically, he grabbed the Ultimatrix. There was a hiss and a crackle as Shigaraki's quirk ate through the rags, and then the casing around the watch itself. Error, error. Green bolts of energy spat out from the Ultimatrix, even as it turned gray and started to crumble. Countermeasures deployed. Hit the deck. Ben shouted. Green filled everyone's vision, and the explosion knocked even All Might and Supergirl on their backs. When their sight returned, the heroes could see Shigaraki had been blown clear through the bar and into the far wall. Midoriya had also been thrown clear and was somehow still conscious, but the impact had reopened all of his injuries. His bloodstained clothes now looked like they'd been soaked in red paint. And then there was the Ultimatrix, the watch had almost completely turned to dust, with only a few green fragments sticking to Midoriya's arm. Rather than the red of Shigaraki's decay on his skin, however, there was a patch of sickly green that was slowly spreading. Izuku then reached for Midoriya, but he jerked back in surprise when a silvery fluid erupted from the boy's mouth. The same liquid started to pour from all the villains as well, and as it enveloped them, the heroes could see that it was pulling them somewhere else entirely. Ben tried to grab Midoriya again, but he was a beat too slow and his hand touched nothing at all. The silvery portals remained, though, and instead of following after Midoriya, Ben received a punch to the diamond-coated face by a gray-skinned Namu. Nearly twenty more followed their comrade out of the various portals and lunged for the closest person. To their credit, the heroes reacted remarkably fast. Kamui Woods trapped six of the monsters in an instant, and Supergirl and her daughter broke the bones of two more with a few well-placed punches. Where is he? Ultra Girl demanded. For the first time since arriving in Japan, she sounded panicked. Where did he go? Supergirl held another Namu back with one hand and looked to her right with glowing eyes. He's at the second target. All Might stood tall, almost ignoring the handful of Nomis that dogpiled him. I'll get him. Oklahoma smash. After sending the monsters flying, he ran to the hole in the wall, crouched, and got ready to leap. I'll leave these things to you. Ben, go with him, Supergirl said, then briefly paused to freeze two more Nomis with her ice breath. We'll be right behind you. Got it. Ben turned into Jetray and flew off after All Might. Please, kid, Ben thought, please be all right. So all right folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 10. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on finfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.